put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. It's six o'clock on Thursday, the 4th of April. Today, the Prime Minister threatens to sever ties with the European Court of Human Rights over his Rwanda plans. Yes, he's determined to get flights to Rwanda. Now it seems that the Prime Minister is willing, potentially, to pull Britain out of the ECHR, if that's what it takes. A Labour landslide. A new poll reveals Tories could suffer the worst election defeat on record, with Sir Keir Starmer's party predicted to win 400 seats. New guidelines reveal judges should consider more lenient sentences for criminals from disadvantaged backgrounds amid concerns it would create a divide with the middle classes. The World Central Kitchen founder claims that Israeli forces targeted his aid workers systematically, as former top judges say arming Israel breaches international law. And in sport this morning, Arsenal are back of the top of the Premier League for at least 24 hours after beating Luton. Uh, Manchester City hot on their heels, uh, though after scoring four against Aston Villa and Luis Rubiales is in more trouble again. Morning. Watch out for some heavy, possibly thundery downpours in the southeast first thing this morning. Otherwise, there'll be a few showers around and feeling pleasantly warm in any bright or sunny spells. I'll have the forecast later. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello. And this is Breakfast on GB News. Well, you're having quite a week. I am now, yes. You are now, because you're yes. now on right through all week, right through till Sunday. Yes, but do you want to know the good news? Well, oh. I'm right. with you. Ah. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, ha. Yes. With you now till Sunday, so that's a treat for me, maybe maybe not for you. No, no, <laughs> no definitely not, no. Um, but no, that, it's going to be fun. Yeah, but you'll be exhausted. I will be. I already am feeling it a little bit. Because today. those of you who have no sympathy when they just say you sit behind a desk for three and a half hours, which is a fair point, mm. uh, but it is very hard getting up at... Silly o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Especially yeah. when you get as old as us. Mm. Very similar in age, aren't we? Um, but I didn't mind because it's you. Oh, we are there very you go. similar in age, yes. We um, do get on very well, don't we? We do. It's very do. nice. No, it's nice. It, it Apart from when is... she rang me last night and said, um, I'm thinking of wearing cream. Yes. So it's like, oh, this is the closest I could get. I really it sort like of works. this, though. Cream with gold flecks, I think. I it's, like this as well. But it's like a wedding out. I like it. It's a bit like more a wedding out. outfit. If you're listening on the radio, you will have to get on the app or whatever just to have a look at our dazzling outfits. We do make the effort, don't we? We try and match as best we can. And look, I even tried to match my necklace and my earrings. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah it's all in all in the detail. It is Devil's in the, detail. in the detail. Oh, there you go. You see, no effort is spared for this exactly. program. Um, there's a lot going on in the news today. It's a busy old news agenda. The Prime Minister 
has suggested he's going to pull out of the European Court of Human Rights if it stands in the way of his Rwanda migration scheme. Yes, Rishi Sunak said that controlling illegal immigration is more important than membership of the legal body and he would not let a foreign court interfere in sovereign affairs. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, who's in Westminster for us this morning. It's long been called for, certainly by a significant number of Tory MPs. Is the PM going to acquiesce? Well, it's sounding very much like he will, if necessary. Bear in mind that the safety of Rwanda bill is still going through Parliament. It's faced a huge battle to go through the House of Lords. But when it becomes law, it's likely to be challenged by the courts. Now, Rishi Sunak is determined to finally get people on flights to Rwanda some two years after this scheme was announced. If it is blocked uh, by the courts in Europe again, he has heavily suggested now that he will promise to pull Britain out of the ECHR. That is the nuclear option. Um, now, plenty on the right have been calling for this for a long time, people like the former Home Secretary, Soella Braverman, being just one of them. Um, plenty of voters on the right would be very happy to see this. But, of course... It will alienate potentially uh, many of his sort of one nation, more moderate wing. It may alienate also a lot of potential conservative voters. And also uh, the government in Kigali in Rwanda itself said that it would have no part in this deal if it was not going to comply um, with international law. So let's see. It could, of course, be called uh, as, as one of the pledges that Rishi Sunak might make in going to the polls and fighting the next election, whenever that may be. Some speculation that that could be um, in the early summer. Well, meanwhile, Catherine, the, the Tories are on course for a worse general election result than Sir John Majors in 1997. That's according to a new poll out this morning. Yes, another day, another poll and disastrous reading for the Conservatives. Again, it suggests uh, from this very extensive poll of 19,000 people um, that if the election happened today, um, we'd be looking at effectively the 1997 style uh, wipeout for the Conservatives. In fact, even worse, saying the Conservatives would get 155 seats. They got 165, even when Tony Blair swept to power. Um, reform would get 12% of the vote. They wouldn't get any seats, but uh, they would prevent dozens of uh, Conservative uh, seats being held or won by the Tories. And the Lib Dems also on 12%, but they would do rather better by this model um, looking to come out with 49. Now, it's four years today since Sir Keir Starmer was elected leader of Labour. At the time, um, because they'd had such a disastrous showing in 2019, um, it was thought that he would basically be a sort of caretaker uh, leader, that he'd be there for some time before handing on to somebody else, that it would take 10 years or more to get Labour back into a position where they could be elected. My goodness, how things have changed. I've taken a look back um, at his first four years in charge of the Labour Party. Let's have a look at that now. A changed Labour Party on the march, on your side, return to the service of working people. Things can always change, and fast. But current polling predicts a huge Labour majority. How times change. Four years ago, Starmer took over a Labour Party smarting from its worst defeat since 1935. Cumulatively, we lost the trust of the public in the Labour Party as a force for good and a force for change. And we've lost four general elections. Despite calls for a first female leader, the party plumped for another man from North London. On a platform of 10 left-wing pledges, making, he said, the moral case for socialism. Few of those pledges remain intact. But Baroness Jenny Chapman, who was Starmer's political secretary, explains. So things that he said four years ago, before we left the European Union, before COVID, before the financial crisis that Liz Truss 
plunged, plunged us into as a country before our mortgages all went through the roof, things you could say then, you know, it's just not pragmatic or realistic to say the exact same things now. Starmer's determination to root out the anti-Semitism that had surged under Corbyn led to a zero tolerance approach and quickly high profile figures being sacked or losing the whip, including the former leader himself. Changing the party hasn't been easy. When Labour lost the Hartlepool by-election to the Tories in May 2021, Starmer came close to resigning. The ensuing reshuffle aimed to clip the wings of deputy leader Angela Rayner, but ended with her gaining a whole host of titles. But weeks later, the Partygate scandal began to break and Labour passed the Tories in the polls. Boozy parties in Downing Street. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Yes. As the Conservatives have swapped one Prime Minister for another and another, against a backdrop of high taxes and stretched public services. The Labour lead has only grown. Here's Scarlett Maguire, pollster at JL Partners. And one thing that Keir Starmer has managed to do is make himself and the party look like a safe option again, especially around issues like immigration and the economy. And his numerous U-turns on policy have been seized on by the Tories. Now he seems to be opposing that policy. It's only Wednesday. I know he flip-flops, but even for him it's pretty quick. The war in Gaza has led to rebellions and the humiliation of George Galloway winning Rochdale. But Starmer is focused on acting like a prime minister in waiting. We actually recently asked voters to describe Keir Starmer in a single word, uh, and the most commonly used words were weak, uh, boring, unsure. People also use words like honest and competent and leader. And I think one thing that we hear more and more from people is that actually the more they see of him, at least they think he might be a little bit more um, normal than Rishi Sunak. Something we hear a lot, we hear, we don't know what Keir Starmer stands for. We're not sure what the Labour Party stands for, but they must be better than what we've just had for the last 14 years, so we're going to give them a go. In just four years, Sir Keir Starmer has dragged the Labour Party back towards the centre and to the edge of power. Catherine Forster, GB News. So Scarlett Maguire there saying that um, voters consider Labour to the, be the least bad option, hardly a ringing endorsement. But I think it is worth saying what a huge achievement it is that Sir Keir Starmer has dragged Labour from this horrendous result back in 2019 to a position where it's now expected that he's going to get a, a huge majority and you know, it's easy perhaps to underestimate him because of the chaos within the Conservatives. But he is quite ruthless. He does want to win and he is going to do whatever that takes. It does look very much at the moment like he's going to be our next Prime Minister. OK, Catherine, thanks very much indeed. Now, judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived backgrounds. The Sentencing Council has, for the first time, explained the mitigating factors that include poverty, low educational attainment, experience of discrimination and insecure housing. Uh, well, let's talk to former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley. Peter, good to see you this morning. Is it not right to look at mitigating factors like these? Judges always have done and they always will do. They do not need it laying out from a body, the Sentencing Council, formed in 2010, which, with this ridiculous set of guidelines, has just shown how unfit for purpose it is. Judges, take these factors into account. This is deeply insulting to anybody who was born into poverty, who was not particularly academic, who went on to make a decent living, uh, contributing to society. And quite frankly, it's just shown that this council that was established in 2010 is not fit for purpose and should be abolished forthwith. And, it, you know, Peter, depending on whatever background you're from, whether that's upper class, whether it's whether you're born into poverty, you should know the difference between right and wrong, surely? Absolutely, and we should all be judged as equals in the eyes of the law. But this just flies in the face of all that. And let's look at the broader picture here. In the UK, sadly, our streets are becoming increasingly lawless. We have an absolute epidemic 
of shoplifting and assaults on uh, retail staff. There's massive increase in violent crime. Car crime is, is dreadful. Burglary, none of these are being investigated. Nobody's being caught. So on those occasions when people are arrested, charged, put in front of a court and convicted, what, what are people going to do now? They're simply going to say, I came from a tough background. Life was hard for me, so please give me a lesser sentence. There are no deterrents these days, which is why, sadly, crime does pay. You say this highlights the need to basically get rid of the sentencing council, but isn't it necessary, Peter? I mean, it's, it, 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 to provide those guidelines so that judges up and down the country are, are sentencing in a similar way? It's these guidelines that have led to so many sentences that have had the public and the media up in arms in recent years. This body was only formed 14 years ago. It's not like it's cemented into the very heart and soul of our judiciary. And having been in many, many courts and in front of many, many judges as a witness, I hasten to add, rather than a defendant, I've always uh, erred on the side of trusting the wisdom of judges to come to their decisions. It is judges who hear all the facts of a case and not the sentencing council. So I think this kind of prescriptive uh, instructions that are being handed down are damaging. They tie the hands of judges very often, and consequently, people do not receive the suitable punishments that they should. Do you fear that this will excuse criminality? Yes, and that's why it's so deeply insulting to people like me who, who, who came from a, a, a rather impoverished background, please forgive me, um, who came from a rather impoverished background, didn't achieve particularly well at school, and then went on to live a law-abiding life. It's so, so insulting to people to just say, well, if, you're, if your start in life is difficult, then we'll understand if you go off and have a life of crime. Utterly insulting. Peter, really good to see you this morning. Thanks very much indeed. And if you've got a view on that, do let us know. GBviews at gbnews.com. To Gaza now, where outrage continues worldwide after an Israeli strike killed seven aid workers on Monday. The founder of World Central Kitchen has now accused Israeli forces in Gaza of systematically targeting his aid workers car by car. Seven team members between the special uh, specialty security people we have, three British individuals and three, uh, three international crew plus one Palestinian, that they were targeted systematically, car by car. Well, Israel has apologised, saying it was a grave mistake and unintentional. Well, it all comes on what is the 75th anniversary of NATO. Well, joining us now to discuss this in more detail is defence editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Good to see you this morning, Robert. I mean, we, we heard there from Israel, didn't we, saying that it was a grave mistake. They have apologised. Meanwhile, the world's central kitchen founder has said this was a systematic attack and these cars were taken out one by one. Well, there may be more to what uh, Jose Andres says than to what the Israelis have been saying, I'm afraid. There is some very ugly evidence coming out about the way targeting takes place in Gaza. And there have been some really eye-watering reports from the liberal and sometime pioneering daily uh, Haaretz, which has been interviewing returned commanders from Gaza uh, re they're reserve forces, so they're not professionals, but they are, they are officers. And they say commanders in the Gaza Strip in the various sectors, according to one, quote, they make up their own rules. And uh, Haaretz explains how commanders has have designated these boxes known as killing zones. And anybody who enters a uh, killing zone, whether they have a weapon on them or not, uh, unidentified, is seen as a target. Furthermore, Haaretz goes on to question the nature of the 9,000, uh, the identities of the 9,000 Hamas that the Israeli Defence Forces claim to have killed. They said it's very, very hard to say. 
So um, what I'm trying to say is that there is a very important case to answer that discipline is breaking down in the Israeli forces in, in Gaza. And the argument that we heard that these were deliberately targeted has some cir circumstantial evidence in that they were fired at in three different locations. They were fired at most likely from drones firing spike missiles. Now, the drone pilots and coordinators and pro programmers must know about how this came about. And yet, we did. Is, is there not some credence as well to what Israel is saying? There was one minister um, getting behind the microphone um, uh, in the last 24 hours saying, well, look, th this is awful, it's really unfortunate, but it's war and it happens. He, and he went on to say, yeah, we've unfortunately killed 30 of our own IDF soldiers, we killed three hostages um, that we were trying to get back into Israel. It's awful, but it's a war zone. Uh, that's not good enough. Um, you, you, you can say that because where is the war, war taking you? And I think that that is the big suspicion and where uh, there have been prominent uh, world statesmen. Pedro Sanchez, interestingly, the Spanish prime minister, has said that he doesn't believe the, um, the Israeli excuses, nor has uh, Antonio Gutierrez of the, of the U UN. And this is where the re response, uh, I'm afraid, from the foreign minister, Lord Cameron, has saying that re really that we, we have asked for a full and frank inquiry. Well, we ask all the time uh, for, for these. There are uh, the figures given by the Hamas uh, 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 Ministry of Health. Uh, I have to say that that is the source of the being 30, 32,000 uh, Palestinian killed, they, that does seem credible. But what also seems credible is that by accident or by design, is that Israel is now conniving at a policy of mass starvation. Mm. Oh, which is a, a chilling thing to say. Uh, Robert, we've got to leave it there, unfortunately. But for now, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, still to come, a workforce fund has been introduced to tackle challenges in the cancer sector to improve patient care. We'll be discussing that and much more next. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Six twenty-three. Good morning to you. Now, cancer patients have faced worsening delays for treatments amid chronic staff shortages 
exacerbated, of course, still by the pandemic. Well, according to the World Health Organization, around 40% of physicians could leave the profession over the next five years. Well, a workforce fund has now been created to tackle the challenges within the sector and try to improve patient care. Well, joining us now in the studio is leading oncology nurse, Professor Andreas Haralambus, and Executive Director of the European Cancer Community Foundation, Mike Morrissey. Very good morning to you both. Morning. Uh, and we'll morning. start with you, Andreas. Just how bad is this crisis? Well, when um, we want to describe the crisis on a global scale, then we can say that every country is facing the problem to some extent. When we're talking about uh, the UK, we're talking about shortages of uh, cancer nurses, uh, cancer doctors, uh, pharmacists, technical staff, and speaking about cancer care, it's a very complex uh, process. We need all these specialties to be in place in the right numbers, in the right skill mix, in order to be able to provide high quality care. So the problem is quite high and it affects, if we take, for example, that the workforce is the backbone of uh, the healthcare systems and the backbone is compromised, then the whole care is compromised. Yeah, uh, Mike, how is this cancer workforce fund going to actually work? What difference can it actually make? Well, we're trying to address a problem that we haven't seen in 50 years, Stephen. You know, it's, it's at that scale. And Andreas set up a foundation last year to attract funding from outside healthcare. We're very good in healthcare about talking to each other, mm. but what we'll be doing tonight at the Mansion House with the Lord Mayor of the City of London is attracting people from outside healthcare to come and fund projects in the communities to make a difference to the workforce crisis. Because mm. if you meet people on the front line of healthcare, they're very creative, they've got the solutions, they know where the problems are. There's huge amounts of bureaucracy that shouldn't be there. There's a lack of technology sometimes for processes that could be automated. So we're getting our doctors and nurses and pharmacists to spend all their time form filling and not with the patients and their loved ones. Mm. And is that why the European Cancer Organisation is conducting this extensive survey, trying to find out more about the working conditions and then, I suppose, try and find an answer, a solution to all of this? Yeah, we're doing this survey across Europe. And what we found in the UK is that 55% of cancer professionals say that their work is endless. Mm. I mean, that kind of mm. burnout that we're seeing from cancer professionals, of course, a lot of it was during COVID that it started, People have left the profession and then the ones left in the profession have got more work to do. Mm. It, Andreas, is there a concern about getting... I mean, obviously, you're, you're trying to get hold of money, as Mike was saying, from, from outside the health sector. But is there a, does that raise a concern? Because, in a way, that's not how you want to fund a system, necessarily, is it? Especially in the UK. You know, it's all meant to be covered. So the idea of having to get outside companies to fund and continually fund this sort of care is, is a concern, isn't it, as necessary as it may be? I, I, don't, I don't think that it is a concern, but the, the thing and, and what this um, uh, uh, workforce fund is going or trying to do is not to, to replace the, the healthcare system. It, it, it's here to provide uh, different things that the healthcare systems are doing uh, in the UK and, and across Europe. We're here, as uh, Mike already said, to fund those initiatives that can uh, provide solutions to the problem, to the crisis, solutions that are coming from uh, the healthcare professionals who have an insider view of the actual problem. So we're not here to replace, but we are here to complement and, and make um, uh, care more comprehensive. How, I mean, how frustrating is it that, as you say, people working within the sector, with, particularly within oncology, have all this sort of wealth of information and it, we, get, we get the impression then that they're not being listened to, they're not able to put that, that knowledge to real use or to the right use? Well, that, that is true. I, I mean, we, we haven't come to the workforce crisis uh, overnight. I mean, uh, we, we could have seen this problem manifesting itself uh, at least a decade ago. And I would say that 
poor action in the process has resulted uh, in, in the numbers that we're looking uh, today. But of course, COVID computed contributed to it as well. But uh, as you said, we have to be listening to our workforce much more and we have to give them the right tools so that their voices are raised and heard. Mm. Mike, how important are conversations like this, conversations about the Workforce Fund, events like tonight, in terms of this being a global cause? Because if you think about it, there's probably hardly a person in this world whose life hasn't been touched by cancer. Yeah, and can you imagine if you are and your treatment gets delayed because there isn't a pathologist available, there isn't a nurse available, and we all know that waiting with cancer is not, is not great. Mm. So I think that that's an added part of the urgency of this crisis with cancer. This workforce crisis is affecting the whole of healthcare, but delays on cancer are so critical that we need to do something about it. And to Stephen's point earlier, we'll be funding pilots of projects that would never get funded within the healthcare system to prove that the ideas of doctors, nurses and pharmacists on the ground work and can be rolled out more widely. Well, let's hope it has the impact that you want. Mike Morrissey, Professor Harold Ambers, good to see you both this morning. Thanks very much. Thanks for having Thank us you. on. Thank you. Both of you. As you say, everyone's affected by cancer one way or another these yeah. days. It's urgent need, isn't it? So um, let's hope something can be done. Mm. And those professionals can be listened to because they know best, don't they? <laughs> well, they do. They do. All right, shall we see what the weather's going to do? Let's. Uh, it was miserable driving in this morning. I hope the day's going to improve. Let's get the details <laughs> with Alex. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. And sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers. And in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north, most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, it's our biggest giveaway of the year so far. Your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise for two, £10,000 in cash and a whole host of luxury travel gifts. Your 2025 holiday could be on us. Here are all the details you need. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
I love the music of that, don't you? You feel like you're transported to Greece. I, to be fair, I couldn't really hear it. Oh, well, that's your age. Different suppose. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, darling. Um, I quite fancy a little. I know. I, I wish we could enter. Yeah, could do with go. a Greek cruise. It'd be very nice. Could do it? with a luxury Greek two, cruise. Two for two people, being you could go. I know. It'd be very good. We'd enjoy that. Yeah, it'd be great. Maybe uh, we'll get someone else to enter on our behalf. <laughs> no, that's no, no, no. We're not doing that. Don't we? <laughs> with all the, um, <laughs> all, the all, uh -oh. all the legal teams <laughs> involved. No, we're not doing that. I'd like to complain uh, about yeah. what's been going on there. <laughs> Someone's been winning competitions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. no. Uh, Paul Coy is here. As as you can see, good morning. Hello. Why is a post deaf? As deaf as a post. Where does that come from? Did oh, someone it's think it's solid? So, yeah. Is that what it is? Well, can't it's hear, it hear very much. It. It's just like a post. I don't know. I don't know. But why do you talk to a wall? I don't know. Mm. Some of life's great unanswered <laughs> mysteries. <laughs> is. Um, one of which is Arsenal being top of the league. Yeah. The thing is, I did. I've had a lot uh. of. Flack, shall we say, oh, on social media. Have you? I know this amazes you already that anybody would complain about anything I said, but quite a lot of Arsenal fans have been on my case saying he never seems to mention Arsenal too much when they win. No. Which is bitter. completely just... unfair. So Arsenal 2, Luton 0. Anyway, Man City <laughs> played <laughs> Aston Villa. So well done, Arsenal. Well done. But is it only like. <laughs> they go to the top of the Premier League for, 20... for 24 oh, hours at the moment. Yeah. 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 Oh, good on them. Yeah, <laughs> good for them. So um, it was Luton. They were completely in control. There was no problem. So there we are. Yeah. Okay. Manchester City are hot on their heels at the moment, though. Yeah. Um, this is the time of the season when Manchester City then push on. It's always around this time as they head towards the end of the season. But there's been a few wobbles. But there certainly was no wobbles against uh, Aston Villa yesterday. They won 4-1. Phil Foden, 23-year-old Phil Foden... The one with scored... the hair. He's, he's got the hair. Yeah. He has... Oh, yeah, you don't like his hair, do you? No, it's very Lego. I know. Yeah. Don't, cos we, we had his hairdresser in on this very show. <laughs> really? The one who does the stripes and the... Oh, and really? The... Yeah. And did you say... I said it Why? looks fantastic. <laughs> yes. And then they oh, said, yeah. I could do that for you. And you go, another time? If I was 20 years younger, I would. There you go. Stop. So, anyway, because, of course, he's 23. It won't make you 43. 43. Yeah. That's exactly right, isn't it? Yes. So, Phil Foden, <laughs> then, scored his fourth <laughs> hat-trick. And um, there's a list, actually. Um, the most hat-tricks under the age of 24 in the Premier League. And I'm going to ask you this. Who do you think is on the list? There's one, yeah. two, three, four great strikers. So I don't want to put you on the who spot here. For? Ellie, who would you go for? Well, as a Spurs fan, it's got to be Harry Kane up there. Good. Harry Kane is one. Scored okay. six hat tricks under. Yes, very good. Six. Yeah. What about Robbie Fowler? No. Yes, <laughs> uh, you're absolutely correct. Robbie oh. Fowler has scored more than anybody else. Seven. Very good. Oh, thank you. Very, very good. Much indeed. So there's two others. Um, think Man City as well at the moment. Who's the young one in Man City at the moment? Are you thinking uh, Erling Haaland? That's yes. the one, the tall one. Very good, the tall one is right. Yeah, Erling five. Haaland. And the other one <laughs> is... Uh, uh, I don't know. Young, very young, maybe very staying young. playing for England, Liverpool player as well, at the time, Michael Owen. Really? They were the, they were the only... Uh, and myself as well was the other one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, under the age of 24, more hat-tricks than anybody else. And Phil Foden was magnificent yesterday. So, Man City 4, Aston Villa 0. In the Brentford-Brighton game, by the way... Very dull. Mm. Well, it, you'd think so, but the thing that did make it very interesting was a refereeing decision, because usually you get a situation when a referee is sent over to the screen. So, VAR would intervene, yeah. and they go, go and have a look at this on the screen, which usually means that the person sitting in the box has said to the referee, have a look at this, there's going to be something overturned. Uh, but Andy Madley was called to look at... It, it was um, uh, Johan Wieser on Lewis Dunk had fouled him in the box, so he's, he's going to have a look at this. But then Madley looked at the screen, so this is like pitch side, yeah. and then realised there was another foul before that and said, no, I disagree. And that's very rare that happens. It's only the second oh. time in the Premier League this year. Good on him, though. You're astounded by I that am. fact, I'm just aren't like, you? I'm glad they're not intimidated by... That's it. Yeah, or whatever. I'll be That's told. it, because usually once they're told, then they usually have... It, it goes with whoever's told them, but mm. he's gone against it. And that was the right decision, and both managers agreed as well. Yeah, she's incredible. Should we look ahead tonight? Yeah, Liverpool versus Sheffield United. You can't. I mean, Liverpool 
will be top should they win. Sheffield United are bottom at the moment. You cannot see anything else than a Liverpool win at Anfield. And uh, Chelsea, I mean, this is going to be a ding-dong. Chelsea versus Manchester United is tonight as well, yeah. both in the Premier League. That'll be good. We're, we're out of time. Can we talk skipping? Do you want to do that now? Can or we, we going to... No, I tell you what, let's do it now. It's let's so it quick. Now. It's the Are quickest we... thing you'll ever see. On, it's the quickest thing. World skipping. How, how many times can someone skip in 10 seconds? 10 oh, seconds. Uh, um, 20. No, uh, 200. Two, you know, 228. Look at this. Look at this. This what? is unbelievable. And watch this person skipping. It's not... <laughs> That's unbelievable. On mega speed. Still at that. Honestly, I was like, you need a rope, though. Yeah, that's what you're missing. Oh yeah. yeah fine. Mind you, not that you. And a lay down after that as well. Not that you could see the rope. Two hundred and twenty-eight times. Wow. That's fantastic. Amazing. I love how I said twenty. <laughs> you said twenty. Because that would be impressive. If I've yeah. always that. wanted to be able to do it. I get two, and then I get my feet yeah. caught. I just could never do. Because you thought they had to sing a nursery rhyme as they were doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I was taking it like this, like one. Mm. Two, three, yeah. I thought it was a good pace, but... No, the vinegar rubbish. One, love that. We'll look at that again later vinegar on, because I love that. Da, 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 yeah. Da, yeah. Right, get off. OK, thanks. thanks a lot. Bye. All right, we've got the papers cool. heading your way in just a moment with Andy Williams and Suzanne Evans. Don't go anywhere. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. Let's take a look at Gloucestershire first. The southbound M5, we've got a lane closed because of a car fire. That's from Junction 10 for Cheltenham to Junction 11 for Gloucester. Merseyside, the southbound M57, a lane is closed here. There's been an accident between Junction 2 for Brescott to Junction 1 for Tarbuck Island. The A533 Central Expressway in Cheshire, the northbound side is closed for emergency repairs. That's at the Bridgewater Expressway Junction and taking a little look now into West Yorkshire, the M62, that eastbound side, two lanes closed here. There's been an accident this morning from Junction 31 for Castleford to Junction 32 for Colorado Way at Pontefract. There's more in 30 minutes. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's eight, f uh, no, it's not, it's 6 40. <laughs> Very, very well. Let's have a look at some of the newspapers for you this morning. The Eye has Gaza plunged into a new aid crisis. It comes as those seven aid workers were killed by Israeli airstrikes on Monday. The Express leads with Rishi Sunak saying he will leave the ECHR. The Mail has about a dozen MPs being targeted with a sinister cyber honey trap. The Times leads with a dementia breakthrough as blood tests may detect Alzheimer's years earlier. And the Mirror has a gang that ran an international dogfighting ring in the garage of a couple's village home. Oh, Smashed, thankfully. Disgusting. Mm. Yeah, I hate that sort of mm. thing. 
Well, joining us to go through what's making the news this morning is political commentator Andy Williams and former UKIP Deputy Chair Suzanne Evans. Very good to see you both this morning. 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 Andy, let's start with you, shall we? Uh, the front page of the eye this morning. Mm. Gaza now in an aid crisis. These aid charities, many of them, uh, are pulling out now after mm. what happened to those seven aid workers. Yeah, I mean, we're almost six months on from the horrific uh, 7th of October attacks. And I think the, 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 the seven aid workers who were killed... <clears throat> seem to have united the international community in condemnation of the way that Israel is behaving increasingly recklessly, frankly. You know, it's not acceptable for a democratic government to be going around just mm -hmm. uh, killing people left, right and centre, aid workers, you know, whether it was by accident or not. It's totally reckless and it is causing further problems around the, the poverty and the chaos mm -hmm in the region. You know, aid workers, understandably, are now worried that it's unsafe to be taking aid into Gaza, and that's just perpetuating the crisis further. It was always unsafe to take aid into Gaza, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely, but, I mean, it's probably never been less safe. I mean, it really, it really is. You have to be an extremely brave person and commend everybody who's out there taking vital aid in, because the situation is getting worse and worse. We're hearing horrific stories about... Uh, refugees eating animal food, malnutrition being rife. I mean, it's just really heartbreaking. I think questions being asked, isn't it? Because uh, steps were taken in order to protect these aid workers. It, it's thought that they, these cars had logos on, on the roofs of, of these vehicles that clearly stated they were from an aid agency. And they say that they had planned that route with the IDF, mm. so the IDF knew exactly where they'd be at, at a certain time. Well, the Israeli Defence Force has, of course, apologised. And by any standards, this is an absolutely appalling tragedy. And clearly, there's an investigation undergoing in Israel. Uh, and let's see what, what happens to that. But I think what concerns me is that this is being used to fuel new calls for an arms ban to Israel. And, and that really worries me. I mean, have we really forgotten the atrocities of October the 7th so very quickly? Have we really forgotten that there are still 99 hostages being held by Hamas? Those are the ones that are alive. We know, think there are at least 35 bodies that they're sitting on as well. You know, th th this call for a ceasefire is actually just playing into Hamas's hands. Except, and, and you know... I, you know, really, I would agree with you. Because mm. um, I, I always thought, you know, what what uh, reaction did anyone, ex did Hamas expect yeah. following, following that atrocious crime on the 7th mm. of October? The question is now forming, though, and it's forming within Israel itself mm. as to whether this has been handled correctly, whether Netanyahu has done the right thing, whether there is a proper strategy in place here, whether, frankly, they have just gone too far. Well, this, this is certainly true. I think Netanyahu's popularity in Israel itself is kind of on the wane now. Um, but the fact is, as I said, you've still got hostages there. If Hamas were to release the hostages and say, right, we're going to go into, we want a proper diplomatic solution to this, then the war would end tomorrow. It would end today if Hamas put down their weapons and suggested that now. But the fact is they're never going to do that. They're still committed to wiping Israel off the face of the planet. And as long as Hamas still has that goal, I'm afraid there's not going to be an end to this but conflict. We, but we, and we condemn that. Mm, right, absolutely. Rightly so. There is a question now, though, as to whether there are some within Israel, in the hierarchy in Israel, who are now just determined to wipe... Gazans off the face of the planet. Well, that's not their stated objective. They obviously want to end Hamas. It's not, but it and seems I think, to be happening. you know, the other thing I think is it's a very difficult position for the UK. We've obviously had Rishi Sunak and David Cameron coming out quite rightly and very strongly against this tragedy of the the aid workers that have been killed. But I think if Britain, as a country, uh, starts to starts to criticise its Israel ally and stop sending weapons out there, then I think that sends a very dangerous message. This is the only. Democracy democracy in the Middle East. Um, they are allies of ours. I think we do need to support Israel against the terrorist threat, not least because if we don't, it in, inflames and, uh, and, and enables the Islamist forces worldwide across the Middle East, terrorists in every country. Um, it it's basically sends a message that, you know, we're going to bow down to you, we're going to give up. And that makes our own security here in Britain a lot less secure. Yeah, and Suzanne, I don't disagree with you broadly, but I do think we have to ask the question, how far does this need to go before we do need to take a hard line, a tougher line, on the way that Israel and the Netanyahu government are behaving? We've had 30,000 Gazans, mostly innocent Gazans, mm. killed now. Mm. 
it, I think there is an irony, actually, that it's taken uh, only seven aid workers being killed to kind of raise this further up the agenda. But that's there has the to be a lot. That's what the yeah, morning, doesn't it? absolutely. And that's what Jack Straw, the former foreign secretary, has been saying well, this look, morning. Look, bottom line, Israel has apologised for this. It's recognised it's committed an atrocity, potentially a war crime, and it has apologised and there is an investigation. When did Hamas ever apologise for anything or launch an investigation into its terrorist atrocities? But there does have to be a line somewhere, and the question is, where is that line? Well, I think the line is very often asked of Israel. That line is not being asked by the same people that want the answer arms ban and the ceasefire of Hamas. And that's my argument. OK. Uh, let's have a look at the mail, and it's in the Express as well. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the papers, actually, this morning. The Prime Minister, <laughs> you could maybe say, finally, <laughs> threatening to leave the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah, he's basically saying that he'll leave the treaty if it blocks flights to Rwanda, which, of course, we're still going through the Houses of Parliament in terms of the Rwanda Bill and the safety of Rwanda Bill. We're nearly there. It's in its final stages. but. What's going to happen? Who knows? Let's see when it comes well, to the vote. But you can guarantee but the ECHR will block it. I you think can the ECHR it. probably will. So then we come to the question, well, this is what Rishi Sunak is saying, but does he really have the courage of his convictions to do this? And I think that's very much open to, to, to doubt. You look at the way Rishi Sunak has behaved since he become, became Prime Minister. He's very much been one of those kind of liberal one-nation Tories, rather than on being on the right of the party and supporting the right of the party. He sacked Suella Braverman. He's had uh, ministers leave because he's not doing, not taking a tough line on immigration. We've heard people like Robert Jenrick, the former immigration minister and former Home Secretary Suella Braverman, saying, look, he's just not interested in this issue. He doesn't want to talk to us about immigration. So, really, Rishi? Really, Rishi? Are you really going to do this? Uh, I think, you know, potentially he could make it an election issue. But I don't think he's really got the courage of his convictions to leave the ECHR personally. But you could say he is so determined to get these flights off the ground that he is willing to leave the ECHR. Or at least he's saying he is. I don't think he is willing mm. to leave the ECHR. I don't think he has the balls to do that, um, if I can say that this time in the morning. <laughs> you put that rather more firmly than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I really don't think he does. But I actually don't think he should. I think we're in the ECHR for good reason, which is that Britain should be taking a position of moral leadership on the world stage, and the ECHR is in place to prevent inhumane treatment of people, and this, in some cases, would amount to that. You know, the problem with the Rwanda policy, apart from the fact that it's exorbitantly expensive, apart from the fact that it's actually achieved nothing so far, is that there will be refugees who are genuinely at risk of harm, who've entered the UK, who could be sent to Rwanda, which we have unilaterally declared a safe country. Go well, on then, Suzanne. Well, I, ju <laughs> I, ju I just think, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about safety again. What about the safety of people in this country? We know that terrorists have come over on those boats. We know they've committed atrocities when they're here. We know that unless something is done about it, they're still going to come from, the, from France, which is a safe country where they are at no risk of harm. Um, you've got to do something. Now, I might agree that the Rwanda scheme is not the best scheme, but it's the scheme that's on the table and it's the scheme that's... Um, hopefully going, going to happen. Yes, but what so, are the other consequences of leaving the ECHR? Well, there are others, and, and I must admit, I share some of those worries. After all, we helped to write the ECHR. It's something that I, I think is in our, in our blood and our bones, Absolutely. if you like, in that sense, and you've got to have some system of human rights. But the fact is, every other country in the world, everybody accepts uh, that... We wouldn't, we wouldn't have this, for instance, in Japan, which is not in the ECHR. In Japan, somebody enters the country illegally, they're sent home. There, there isn't... There, you don't have people trying to prevent it's talking about, oh, Japan's a racist country because they won't let every illegal immigrant in. I mean, let's get real about this. There is a massive problem with these small boats, a massive problem, um, and, and something has got to be done about it. And mm. if that means leaving the ECHR and putting in our own independent Bill of Human Rights, then... I don't have a problem with that. But what is that independent bill of human rights? Well, I don't a, understand. Well, that we don't that's know. up to Parliament to be decided. I suspect well, it would look have, very like to, the if ECHR. You're willing, if you want to leave the ECHR and you accept that a bill of human rights of some kind is important, 
you have to put an alternative proposal on the table. You can't just say, we'll leave and we'll work it out later as if human rights is some third or fourth order concern. No, you and, have I, to and, have and that an wouldn't be how it worked. There would be, I'm sure there would be an alternative in place before we left. And as well, I say, this it, could I... potentially be an election issue. That could be done very quickly. An alternative could be put forward very quickly. Rishi could, in theory, have a snap election precisely on this issue. I don't think he will. Well, we both agree he's possible. not going to, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Andy, some good news is a potential dementia breakthrough. This is on the front page of The Times this morning. Yeah, this could be a huge breakthrough. So it's <clears throat> the introduction of cheap, simple, easy to use tests for mm. people who may have dementia. We know that one of the major challenges with dementia is the shocking levels of diagnosis. It's incredibly low. More than a third of people who are living with dementia don't know that they're living with dementia. So um, a really positive step forward here. Well, it's, yeah. it's difficult, isn't it? Because at what point... We, we don't... Most of us don't understand dementia because it's that... It's that differ, it's differentiating it between you know, Alzheimer's, dementia and mm. just getting older. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've, I've been told by my daughter that I've got more signs of dementia than my, her, her grandmother, but I've said, yeah, I've always been like that. I've got a terrible memory, so I don't know where it starts and ends. But, you know, this is good news. Um, a friend of mine's just been diagnosed with early-onset dementia. Very mm. sad. She's younger than me. Um, and for years, she was told it was menopause symptoms. Really? That, which I was told as well, actually, when I had some, some memory problems. It was resolved. But, um, yeah, she was told it was, was menopause. She's been through terrible anxiety and depression as a consequence. She's now got the diagnosis. She's been put on drugs. They have been working miracles. Really? It's a fantastic story. So the fact that this is potentially going to mean that more people are going to be in her shoes and are going to be diagnosed mm. and actually get treatment early enough to make a difference well, is fantastic. Well, that's the thing. Diagnosis is one thing. It's treatment, which is obviously... They've got to follow on from that. But if that, were, if that happens, then brilliant. Very welcome. Mm. Um, should we have a look at um, Excalibur? Yes. Mm. Excalibur. Uh, they're searching for Excalibur. <laughs> well, really? This, this did make me laugh this morning. Yeah, it's a, it's a team of filmmakers, magnet fishers, whatever they are, I'm not quite sure what they are, tech experts <laughs> and divers are embarking on this quest to find the legendary sword Excalibur. Well, I predict now, and you can quote me on this, it ain't going to end well. Because yeah. let's face it, King Arthur didn't exist, did he? And so Excalibur didn't exist. I know there might be some debate about this, but when you look at the legends, they just don't make sense. You know, you've got him living in the 5th century, but apparently in other stories he was carrying Christ's cross. I mean, what, you know, it's a load of nonsense. Suzanne, great as someone story, from, as someone from Winchester, exist. Uh, I have to defend the, the, the truth of King Arthur. There's a lovely statue at the bottom of the oh, high that street. Oh, that must yeah, be true. real, then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. must be real. If it, oh, I agree completely. <laughs> the problem is, unless the sword is actually magic... If it's been in the bottom of a lake, which they sort of think, uh, it won't be there anymore. It will, well, it's going to be very rusty, isn't it? I mean, I don't know how... I don't know what's... what's I hope it's not at the how long it takes a sword to sake, disintegrate. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how... Good luck with it, I think it's going to be like the search for the Holy, Holy Grail. It ain't going to... It ain't going to be found. Well, there's still plenty of people searching for the Holy Grail. There are, are, and good luck to them. They say it might be in the Lake District. Really? really? How else oh, did you yeah. get that? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I Was don't that brought know. over by Joseph yeah, of Arimathea or the, the, something? The, it's something like that. Yes, yeah, but it's in the back garden. Well, could no, that be would be good. Garden. But it is one of those things that people, a lot of people, think it is in the Lake District, and there's still people searching away for it. That'd be quite something. I'd quite like to yeah. stumble across that. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you <laughs> go. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you both very much indeed. We'll see you a little bit later on. Yeah. Let's get the weather now with Alex. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers and in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 
15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north. Most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. Let's take a look at Merseyside first of all. The southbound M57, there's a lane blocked here because of an accident. That's from Junction 2 for Prescott to Junction 1 for Tarbock Island. Now the exit slip to Tarbock Island is also blocked. You have to continue onto the A5300 there. A little look at Runcorn in Cheshire, the A533 Central Expressway northbound is closed for emergency repairs. That's at the A558 Bridgewater Expressway Junction. West Yorkshire now, the eastbound M62. We've got two lanes closed this morning. There's been an accident. That's between Junction 31 for Castleford to Junction 32 for Pontefract. And the A170 Hungate is closed both ways because of an accident at Thornton Liddale, causing queues. There's more in half an hour. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good morning to you. It's 7 o'clock on Thursday the 4th of April. Today, the Prime Minister threatens to sever ties with the European Court of Human Rights over his Rwanda plans. Yes, Rishi Sunak is determined to get people on flights to Rwanda two years after the scheme was first announced. He's heavily hinting now if that means pulling out of the ECHR, that's what he's going to do. A Labour landslide. A new poll reveals Tories could suffer the worst election defeat on record, with Sir Keir Starmer's party predicted to win 400 seats. New guidelines reveal judges should consider more lenient sentences for criminals from disadvantaged backgrounds amid concerns it would create a divide with the middle classes. The World Central Kitchen founder claims that Israeli forces targeted his aid workers systematically, as former top judges say arming Israel breaches international law. Be sincere, be happy for them. Be sincere, be happy for them. Arsenal are back on top of the Premier League for at least 24 hours after beating Luton. Uh, Luis Rubiales is in more trouble and Rory McIlroy is getting a little help on his swing for the Masters next week. Morning. Watch out for some heavy, possibly thundery downpours in the southeast first thing this morning. Otherwise, there'll be a few showers around and feeling pleasantly warm in any bright or sunny spells. I'll have the forecast later. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Uh, 
On that sentencing guideline thing... Oh, yeah, it's got you all going this morning. Yeah, Anthony's been in touch. He says, sorry, doesn't matter what your background is, everybody knows right from wrong. Mm. Robert agrees, saying, what a load of rubbish. It seems people are always looking for an excuse for their poor life choices. I was born and brought up with both parents unemployed. I tried really hard at school, uh, but only attained reasonable results. So long as you achieve the best you are capable of, that's all that matters. Mm. I think that's all anyone can ask. Mm. Not everyone is going to be a brain box and not everyone's going to be good at... You know, the physical stuff. I think we look we look down too much now on people who do what you would call blue-collar jobs. You know, I mean, my cousin's a, a carpenter. What a great job. Yeah, actually. and you need them, my goodness. What a fantastic skill, those yeah. people who go and get an apprentice, a, apprenticeship and learn a trade. And then you're set for life with that trade. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic thing. And you'll always be needed. You'll always be needed. Mm. Whereas I'm rubbish at stuff like that. I mean, it just isn't my... I was, about, I was just thinking, yeah. how would you be changing a light bulb and things like that? Oh, no, I'm all right. Oh, you could do that. I'm all right with the basics. But anything that involves a level of skill, um, just, I, you know, I'm just lacking in that. It's just not what my brain was made for. I can't do that either. Um, and so you're reliant on people who can. And, but that should be treasured and valued and appreciated. All my family were, were, were sort of... Uh, Traders in, in that sense, they all had they all, they all had a trade, and they worked in the shipyard, and what were, were farmers. Or, it's my two sides of the family. One was farming, and one was shipyard in Barrow. Aww. So they all they, they all had skills. They all had yeah. a trade. They all had. That's uh, to be applauded. It's a discipline as well, isn't it? Often? I just hate the fact that we look down on it. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, Archie on that says, I have never had much money, but I've never done anything wrong. I was brought up to know the difference between right and wrong. I'll be 68 in August. Just because you were poor, it's no excuse for criminality. No, well, it's true. It's true. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later on in the show this morning. We'll start off with politics, though. Let us know what you think about this one as well. The Prime Minister suggesting that he will pull out of the European Court of Human Rights if it stands in the way of the Rwanda plan. Yes, Rishi Sunak said that controlling illegal immigration is more important than the membership of the legal body and he would not let a foreign court interfere in sovereign affairs. Uh, let's talk to our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, who's in Westminster for us this morning. Um, it, it's an interesting one because half the, the Conservative Party will applaud him on this uh, and half of them won't be quite so sure. Yes, the Conservative Party is divided uh, about many things at the moment. Uh, staying in or withdrawing from the ECHR being one of them. People like the former Home Secretary, Soella Braverman, very clear that we need to pull out of the ECHR to get these flights off to Rwanda. But there's dozens and dozens of Conservative MPs on the more moderate wing, the, the One Nationers, who would be absolutely horrified and uh, people within the Cabinet who might consider that a resign issue. So Rishi Sunak is, of course, desperate to get people on flights to Rwanda. It's over two years now since the then Home Secretary Priti Patel, the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson, announced this scheme, which was supposed to be, if you cross the channel illegally, you will be sent on a one-way ticket to Rwanda. The thinking was then people would very quickly uh, decide that it was better to stay in France and not make that journey. Now, they, it's going through Parliament, this safety of Rwanda bill, because it's been blocked in the European courts. Worth saying it's been blocked by British courts too. If they can't get people on flights, if once it's gone through Parliament, it's blocked in Europe again, he is suggesting that, yes, um, he'll be looking to pull out of the each ECHR. That would involve potentially a, a pledge in the manifesto going to the polls, the next election, with that being a key pledge. It will bring plenty of voters on board, but it might turn others right off. Okay. Catherine, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's go now to the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Good to see you this morning, uh, Mr Reynolds. We're talking there about the ECHR, Rishi Sunak, so desperate to get flights off the ground to Rwanda that he says he'd be willing to leave the European Court of Human Rights. Is that something that the Labour Party would support? And if it doesn't, how do you intend to tackle illegal immigration? Well, good morning. Quite simply, no, this is just another 
gimmick from the Prime Minister. I mean, to state the obvious, it was a British court which ruled the original Rwanda proposals uh, as being illegal, so there'd be no benefit from doing so. Um, you see, with the entire approach to illegal immigration from this government, one gimmick after another, and I think the British people see through it. I think they're sick of those. I mean, just take Rwanda in itself. Imagine it was happening right now. We've seen over the bank holiday weekend double the number of people crossing the channel that the entire capacity of the Rwanda scheme would cover, which we've paid half a billion pounds for. So, no, we are sick of the gimmicks. There is only one way to tackle illegal immigration, and it's not wasting hundreds of millions of pounds on a scheme like Rwanda. It is through processing those claims fairly and efficiently, removing people from the country who shouldn't be here, not spending millions of pounds a day on hotel places because you haven't been able to process the system as it should do, and, of course, tackling the illegality around it. Whilst there are these endless gimmicks being proposed by the government, nothing will happen on the scale that it needs to happen to tackle a serious problem. Yeah, but, but everything you outlined there, Mr Reynolds, doesn't actually solve the problem, does it? I mean, I mean, you're quite right, we need to process it all a lot faster. You say it send people back who fail. Well, that's problematic at the moment. The returns agreements aren't in place for a lot of that. And there is also, on top of that whole thing, an argument that says, well, if people are going to come here illegally and then be processed quickly and a percentage of them allowed to stay, well, that's just going to attract more people to come across the channel in small boats. Well, look, on your, on your second point, I've got to say, I think the inefficiency of the system we have at the minute in the UK, the slowness of it, I think that is in itself uh, an attractive pull to people to the UK because there's a sense we just don't tackle this problem adequately and therefore people believe there'll be some kind of grey area where at times they'll, they'll fit through the system and do it. I don't believe an efficient system is in itself something which is going to attract people to the UK. But there, there is only one way to tackle this, and it is through seriously and competently addressing the problem that when people do apply to be in the UK, you've got to determine quickly, do they have the right to do so? In which case, yes, integrate them into British society. And if they don't, they've got to be removed. And I think the, the absence of that, I mean, look, what we're talking about here is not some kind of magic formula. It is a home office that can process these claims. Frankly, anything like it was doing just a decade or 15 years ago, it can't be seen as something the British state can adequately do because we've done it adequately in the past. And yes, there will always be people coming. There'll always be the need at times to say that people don't have a right to be here. They can't stay. But given how stretched public services are in the UK, to be spending hundreds of millions of pounds on a scheme like Rwanda, which has done nothing so far, will do nothing even if it is performed. I mean, bear in mind, this is supposed to be a deterrent. I mean, if anyone is of the belief that is the case, why isn't that deterrent working already? I mean, the evidence tells us that it clearly isn't, I'm afraid. Look, we've been talking about the diplomatic fallout of the Israeli missile strike on Monday in which seven people were killed, including three British aid workers. And there's been talks in the Foreign Office since about potentially limiting intelligence sharing with Israel. And this morning, front page of The Guardian, former Supreme Court judges are now adding their voices to calls for an Israeli arms ban. If the Labour Party were to form a government, would you continue to support the Israeli state? Well, first of all, let me say everyone's thoughts and prayers are with the families of those British aid workers and everyone caught up in this unconscionable uh, round of violence in the Middle East. I mean, I have to break that question into, into each of the parts. Look, Israel was attacked on October 7th and, of course, has the right to defend itself, but it must defend itself within international law. Now, specifically on the case of, of British arms exports to Israel, the law of the UK is very, very clear. If there is any possibility of anything exported from the UK being involved in a serious violation of, of humanitarian law, it cannot be exported from the UK. So the government will have had legal advice on that specific to the conflict in Gaza. We've asked them to publish that legal advice. It would be, I think, a reasonable step, given what, what has happened in the last few days and what has happened over the last few months, to make clear the legal position and to make sure the government itself and we are currently complying with UK law. But of course, what really needs to happen more than anything else is to return to, to the end of the conflict, which is a immediate ceasefire, the release of those hostages, an immediate humanitarian surge of aid into Gaza. But before that happens, we clearly must be able to tell the British people we are currently complying with UK law as it stands. I mean, the, the, the idea of the, the problem with an immediate ceasefire is the hostages, mm. isn't it? And uh, at what point do you turn around and say, 
yeah, a ceasefire is great. Hamas needs to release the hostages. If they wanted a ceasefire, they could generate one today. Yes, I mean, the human suffering we are seeing, I think it is hard for anyone to witness that and not feel an immediate sense of, of frustration, of anger, that we cannot bring those two warring parties to a ceasefire that would allow or facilitated by the release of those hostages. And look, I think we all feel that frustration because there's a sense of how, how can we immediately alleviate that human suffering and bring it to uh, an end. I think the, the violence we have seen and the humanitarian situation in Gaza has what has had to produce this call for an immediate uh, ceasefire from all sides in the UK. And if we have that, I can't promise you the hostages could be released. Clearly, that is a material issue in achieving that. But it has to be at the heart of... A ceasefire has to apply to both sides, to be frank. That has to be the case. But clearly, what we are seeing at the minute and the level of human suffering, I think, makes an immediate ceasefire a priority. Mm. We've been talking this morning about the Sentencing Council advising judges to look at softer terms, softer prison sentences uh, for offenders from deprived backgrounds. What do you make of that? Does that sound fair? No, I, I think that does sound fair, to be honest. I think um, justice means you have to apply that in a fair and consistent manner across the country. Of course, there are as ever, a whole range of things any judge would take into discretion when they are when they are giving a sentence. But I, I wouldn't like to give the impression there should be some kind of differential judicial regime for, for people across the country. I think, to be honest, again, I look at the, the criminal justice system and I, I'm afraid I just see a mess. I mean, I see incredibly long waits for court time. I see prisons that are full. It appears they've spent a lot of the the capital investment that should have been in new prison places in, on, on revenue. And frankly, surprisingly, most of all, there is actually a substantial allocation in the government's accounts for new prison places, which hasn't been spent. So for me, if you've got the prison places and a judicial system working properly, you shouldn't be having to ask anyone to give anyone a lighter sentence to not put them into prison if that's the appropriate punishment for them, because you're worried about the prison capacity. I think that is an issue here. But you know, justice has to be applied fairly and consistently to everyone across the UK. Yeah, I, I don't know whether the Sentencing Council was introduced at the beginning of the coalition government or at the end of the last Labour government, but either which way, should it be scrapped now? Look, to be honest, I, I think it plays a role. I, I'm not sure what the argument would be for replacing it uh, entirely, but um, to be frank, what role can it play to the full of its potential effect if there aren't enough prison places and if we've seen the Lord Chancellor having to instruct the judicial system not to put people who should be going to prison in prison because there aren't enough places. I think that at the heart is that the frustration of what needs to be fixed in the criminal justice system. And as I say, it is one area where the government has actually allocated money to it, but it hasn't got around to spending it on the places that we need. OK. Jonathan Reynolds, as always, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. To Gaza now, an outrage continues worldwide after an Israeli strike killed seven aid workers on Monday. The founder of World Central Kitchen has accused Israeli forces in Gaza of systematically targeting his aid workers car by car. Seven team members between the special specialty security people we have, three British individuals and three, uh, three international crew plus one Palestinian, that they were targeted systematically, car by car. Well, Israel has apologised, saying it was a grave mistake and unintentional. Is that going to be enough, though? Mm. Well, joining us now to discuss this in more detail is the foreign editor of Jewish News, Yotam Confino. Good to see you this morning, Yotam. And, and questions are being asked aren't they? Because Israel, as we just heard, says this strike was a grave mistake. But the world's central kitchen founder says this was a systematic strike by Israel. Yeah, <clears throat> the truth probably lies in between uh, what Israel is saying and what uh, the world central kitchen is saying. There's no doubt that this is intolerable, inexcusable and very unprofessional by an army to allow this to happen. Now, whether this was systematic and, and deliberate, actually going after these aid workers, I think that remains to be seen until the Israel can really um, present some of its investigation fully to the world. 
But it makes no sense for Israel to target this organization because not only is it working closely with this organization, it's actually helping them distribute the food that they deliver from Cyprus. But it is also this incident is a massive failure for Israel and it's turning the world against Israel. It doesn't achieve anything by targeting this. Now, that being said, this is still amateurish and inexcusable, unprofessional. So somebody has to pay for this, obviously. It's irresponsible and it shouldn't have happened. I mean, it seems remarkable, Yotam, that, that, that a government minister has come forward and said, well, of course it was a mistake. I mean, look, we've killed 30 of our own soldiers. I mean, which, the, the, the way it was phrased was, was actually very odd. Yeah, I would also say, first of all, this is not the, the first incident uh, in Gaza where Israeli soldiers have acted irresponsibly. They're, they've made numerous mistakes in the past six months. That goes without saying, and the IDF in, in general has also made several mistakes and acted uh, unprofessionally in the West Bank, for example. But this incident is, of course, not right now, it's um, Israel's enemies are trying to, to turn this into an act of deliberate systematic killing of aid workers, which is, of course, serves uh, one part and one part only. That's Hamas. Uh, the more we talk about these things, the more Hamas is benefiting from all of this. And uh, this is, of course, right out of, our, right out of their playbook. And, and Israel is continually falling into this trap and really failing to do uh, their job, which is to target uh, only Hamas and Islamic Jihad and other terrorists and not uh, attacking aid workers. So again, a, a tragedy and, and something that Israel has to explain fully. OK, Yatam Kamfina, good to see you. Thank you. Let's take a look at your weather now for you with Alex Burkle. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers and in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north, most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Now we're very excited by this one because it's our biggest giveaway of the year so far. You could be in with a chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise for two, but that's not all. No, £10,000 in cash to go with it and a whole host of luxury travel gifts. Yes, yeah, so your 2025 holiday could be on us. Here's all the details you need to enter. You could win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. 
gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Fancy a holiday, actually. Oh, me too. We've got anywhere booked? No. No, no, no. Well, it's a very difficult year, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, because... Oh, yes, for us, yes. For us, yes, it is. Because it's like, when is the election? Uh-huh. Um, so booking holidays is very difficult for that. I can't go anywhere in August because I have a great niece on the way. Oh. So I need to be around for that. And so it's all very, very difficult. I know. Oh, it's a tough life, isn't it? I don't know where... Are you still thinking general election in May or have you given up on that idea? No, given up. Whether it'll there you be... go. He was, he was strong on that one, weren't you? Mm, should have been. Should have been May. Um, probably more likely September, October, isn't it, now? I'm fed up awaiting for Well, it. I'd like to go on my holidays in September, so, Rishi, if you're watching, and I'm sure you are... Well, that's what we're thinking, if September. If we could go for October, that would be lovely. But we'd have to go very early on in September, because we'll have all the prep go to the do. Go the first week. That would have to be the first that's week. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. We'll go together. We'll go together. Have a then, lovely time. Then, Rishi, if you, could, if you could get it there for about mid-October, because it's time to prep... Yeah, that'd be We fine. can get the last of the summer sun in the September. We're going to be very, Everyone's very happy. busy. Anyway, more importantly, have we gone... Have we gone too soft on crime? We're going to be debating that next. I bet he is watching as well, you know. Mm. I bet he is. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
7.26. Now, judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders who are from deprived backgrounds. Yes, the Sentencing Council has, for the first time, explained the mitigating factors that include poverty, low educational attainment, an experience of discrimination and insecure housing. So, we're asking today, does that mean we're going too soft on crime? Let's talk to former barrister Neil Hamilton and social campaigner Winston Davis. Good to see you both this morning. Neil, what do you make of this? Yes, I'm a practicing barrister now, by the way, not a former barrister. Um, although I don't, I don't practice in in the areas of crime. But but uh, no, I think that this is a very retrograde step, and I'm very surprised because the Sentencing Council is peopled by top judges and legal practitioners. I'm surprised that they exhibit such a lack of common sense in making this proposal. It's actually an insult to the overwhelming majority of people who do come from difficult backgrounds who lead perfectly law-abiding lives. You know, difficulties in your upbringing may well explain your conduct, but it can never excuse it if what you're doing is committing crimes. Winston, what do you make of it? Do you think it is insulting to those born into poverty who, who are law-abiding citizens? Um, look, I don't think it's insulting. Um, there are there's clear evidence and studies shown that if you have adverse childhood experiences, such as uh, growing up in poverty, poor education, as we talked about just now, that you are, I think it's 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Like uh, the gentleman just said just now, it doesn't um, justify your behaviour, but it does give an indication as to why these people are committing offences. And what I found it more interesting is going, okay, well, if they are now identifying why people are more likely to commit crime or why these people are, are committing the crime and they're committed to end up in prison, well, isn't that a chance then for, to really drill down in the rehabilitation to get them out of prison and to be back in sight as a contributing member of society rather than just saying, well, they're in prison, that's it, and they'll do the minimum rehabilitation and, and kick them out again? I think there's an opportunity here. All right. Look, Neil, it's an interesting point Winston makes. 20 times more likely to commit a crime if you're from a, a, a deprived background. I mean, that, that's well, we got that, to be considered, hasn't it? Well, we know that a lot of the people who are in prison are multiple offenders, and there is a problem with rehabilitation, as we've just heard. Of course, rehabilitation should be a major part of our prison system. Uh, we don't want people to re-offend when they're released from prison. So that part of the system isn't working terribly well at the moment either. But I don't think that it improves the, the criminal justice system to have a kind of two-tier level of sentencing. I think this is going to lead to people perpetuating the, the view of judges being too soft. And I think it's an invitation to people who come from difficult backgrounds, actually, to carry on with their offending. Because if they're going to be treated more leniently by virtue of factors over which they had no control, rather than their behaviour over which they do have control, then that's going to lead to injustice. Winston, it's almost like we're coming in too late with this, talking about lighter sentences for those who are from difficult backgrounds. Shouldn't we be intervening earlier it, it, with, with those young people in those deprived backgrounds who then go in to fall into a life of crime? 100%. And we'll just touch on two points here. And the point just made a minute ago was saying, are we going into a two-tier system? Well, I think just in December, a, a Oxford, Oxford University student was spared jail because uh, for a knife attack because she was deemed too clever and it could harm her career prospects. So, I mean, if that's not a two-tier system already, you know, what, 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 what is? Um, but no, but definitely, certainly, getting in early, the charity that I, that I um, am chair of, we, we target boys that are between the age of 8 to 16 years old, predominantly 8 to 12 years old, with that early intervention, so with the education, with the, the soft skills to try to then give them the awareness to then move away from that kind of life from the start. A, a lot of people, though, Winston, and we've had a lot of emails through this morning saying, no, it, it is an insult to say that the people are more likely to commit a crime if they're from a poorer background. People from you know, whatever background know right from wrong. Well, uh, you know, you've you've been in the system. Mm. Did you know mm. right from wrong? I mean, what what is driving these people? Well, okay. Look, but firstly, I mean, people to say it's an insult. Just double back on that. Say it's an insult. Well, you know, the, the statistics and the facts speak for themselves. So, regardless of how people feel that are coming from deprived backgrounds and that they've done great to not get in trouble and live live a, a balanced life, fantastic. More power to them. But the statistics say that you are more likely to end up committing crime if you're from that kind of background. Um, 
Sorry, I lost you a second there. No, we've, we've sorry, still got I lost you. you there. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we've, we've still got, got you. you. Yeah, so, so I mean, um, look, I think that every case is different. And, you know, like I said, if somebody doesn't uh, end up getting in trouble because of the life that they've been born into, that's wonderful. But if you have, then those people need support. Personally, I grew up and I didn't have the direction. I didn't have the guidance. And the, what I thought and what I made of the world as a child was completely incorrect and wasn't what I've then made, uh, made as the world as an adult. So the opinions that you form when you are 12, 13, 14, and then start committing criminal behavior or bad behavior, without the, the knowledge and awareness, you're just going to keep on doing it. So not until I actually went to prison and sat there and thought about my life, thought, actually, no, nah, this isn't how I want to live. This is not how I want to behave. And what, what happened to me early in my life should not define who I am. I'm a good man. I'm now, I now run my business. I'm married. I do what I'm doing, but because of, of the the uh, foresight of adulthood and the developed mind. Mm. Neil, last word with you because we are running out of time. But isn't this something that judges were doing anyway? They were taking into account yes. mitigating factors when they were applying sentences. Of course, that's absolutely right. There's a separate sentence and hearing after conviction and uh, reports are uh, presented to the judge on background, character, anything else which is relevant to the circumstances in which the crime was committed. Uh, and you know, we often read of what appear on the face of it to be incomprehensible sentences in tabloid newspapers. Of course, it's, it, it's, it's dangerous to judge about that because you've not heard the case yourself. You don't know the circumstances of the individual, like the case that was quoted just a moment ago in, in Oxford. But, uh, yes, judges do take into account individual circumstances. Sometimes judges get it wrong, and sometimes they uh, sentence people too harshly, sometimes too leniently. In case of sentences which are too lenient, the Attorney General can make a reference to the Court of Appeal to have a sentence reviewed. So there, there's a lot of, uh, of individual consideration of cases in, in every particular instance. And I don't think that the Sentencing Council's current uh, guidance has... Uh, recently announced is going to help at all. I think it's going to confuse matters. OK. Neil Hamilton, Winston Davies, really good to see you both this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Winston's in the sunshine. Oh, is he? He's in Thailand, I think. Oh, very nice too. Thank you for joining us, Winston. I wonder <coughs> so what time it a, is. He's made a special effort oh, to, uh, to talk to us. It's an interesting one, though. Um, I, th I don't think people appreciate what it means to, to be in prison. I think for people who say, well, they only got five years or, you know, or will only serve five years or whatever it is, it's a long time. It is a long time. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not... For some people, it needs to be a lot longer, obviously, but for some crimes, you think, I mean, it's a long time. Mm. Mm. It's a long time to be out of the system. But really interesting what Winston was saying there is saying ne shorter sentences necessarily might not be beneficial because you need the time to rehabilitate. If, if the systems if it, are in the there, you've got to, there, well, yeah. at least they both agreed on that, that you mm. need, you've got to be rehabilitated. There's no, we don't, you know, lock the door and throw away the key. That's not what we do in this country. No. We want people to come out and then be, like Winston, be positive, active members of society, which is what he is now. Yeah, absolutely. And good, and good on him for it. Because mm. it must be, it's difficult. I think. No, absolutely. Do let us know what you think of that story, gbviews at gbnews.com. Do stay with us, though, because Paul Coit is going to be here shortly to talk us through all of the latest sport. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. In Kent, the westbound M2, two lanes are closed because of an accident. That's from Junction 3 for Chatham and Rochester to Junction 2 for Strood. Surrey and the anti-clockwise M25, all traffic being held for the moment. A car has come off the road uh, between Junction 6 for Godston and the Clackett Lane services. Queues back to the M23 at Junction 7. Clockwise, people are slowing down to have a look and causing delays there as well. Merseyside, southbound M57. We've got the exit slip blocks at Junction 1 for Tarbock Island because of an accident. A lane is closed on the main carriageway there as well. And in West Yorkshire, the eastbound M62. Two lanes are blocked here. There's been an accident between Junction 31 for Castleford to Junction 32 for Pontefract. There's more in half an hour. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Google it. Uh, Paul Coit's got all your sport for us this morning. What was you doing? Were you talking about me? Oh, you said talking about me. Yeah. 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 Um, Arsenal. Go on, give it some welly. Give it some, some sincerity. <laughs> Arsenal managed to win against Luton at home yesterday, which <laughs> put them to the top of the Premier League. Why do you hate them so much? I don't hate them. Yeah, it's, a lo it's a library. It's a oh, it's an Arsenal thing. They do the same with me. That's this, it's the same thing. So it's it's just a Stephen, it's a very friendly rivalry. Oh yeah, That's right. What it is. <laughs> but um Arsenal, they continue to win. They're doing extremely well. It was Luton and it was it was a canter for them. And that's a phrase I've never ever used when yeah. it's come to football. Uh, but it was, it was that easy. So Man City, though, were on their tail. They won 4-1 against Aston Villa yesterday. Uh, went one up, then it was 1-1, and then there was a, a hat-trick from Phil Foden. Oh. So Manchester City also looking very good, but... Um, tonight, uh, when we had Brentford and Brighton, which was nil-nil yesterday, but tonight Liverpool then could leapfrog Arsenal should they win against Sheffield United, which they should do because Sheffield United are having a, a horrible season. And they're Tell you what, it's exciting at the top three, isn't it? It is, yeah, it really is exciting, yeah. It is, There's, it's, those, it's out of those three. And then, whereas Aston Villa were beaten by Manchester City yesterday, Aston Villa, they're in that race for the top four along with Spurs, four, fourth and fifth. Villa are fourth... United, uh, Spurs are fifth, and then you've got United a little bit lower below there, about eight points below. But it looks like it's going to be the top five who will qualify for the Champions League this year. Right. It's all to do with coefficients. What? Well, it's all to do with different countries and how well they're doing in Europe. Germany, it's between Germany and England at the moment. It's whoever, oh. whatever countries does well will get an extra place in the Champions League. So... It's beneficial for English teams to do well. For example, West Ham are playing Bayer Leverkusen, who are a German team, and should they beat them, then that means there's one more place for an English team. Very good. It's very clear, thank you. Thank um, you very much. Big story coming out of Spain. Yeah, um, the famous song in Casablanca, as time goes by, mm. you must remember this. I, yeah. A kiss yeah. is just a kiss. But in, oh. but in Rubiales' case, a kiss is not just a kiss because a whole heap of everything mm. has landed on him since the kiss <clears throat> that happened at the end of the World Cup final with yeah. Jenny Hermoso. So not only has there been the fact where he's had to step down uh, as running the Spanish FA, he's now awaiting trial uh, for sexual assault for this, and being now investigated on top of this for corruption as head of the Spanish FA, which kind of makes you think, 
you don't want to be arguing against this because it, it's almost the catalyst for everything that's coming on top. Um, he was detained by Spanish authorities, got on a plane from Madrid... Uh, no, to Madrid, actually. He was heading home to Madrid from the Dominican Republic, then was arrested there and now has to deal with... I'll tell you what it is, the actual problem the so-called problem or whatever he's being charged with, is the Spanish Super Cup. Now, the Spanish Super Cup is the Spanish version of the Community Shield, so it's the league winners against the cup winners. Now, you kind of smell a rat when you find that the Spanish Super Cup, a deal was done to have it held in Saudi Arabia for the oh. next 10 years. So they're now looking into that and thinking there's finances, is there payments going right. in? So Luis Rubiales is in a whole heap of trouble. Ooh, ouch. So a kiss is not just a kiss. No, it isn't. It's not the right can of worms, is yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Um, Paul, we've got to leave it there. OK. But we'll see you in the next hour. OK, we've got golf to do in the next hour. Brilliant. Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much. Now, still to come, are you planning to fly away this year? Well, we would like to. Yes, we? please. Uh, well, you can find out why you're in for one more year of the 100 milliliter carry-on luggage rule. That's next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. When I was president of the Durham Union... Mm. Um, back oh, yes, in, yes. ..in 2016, 17, um, I was hosting a debate, um, which was the question, this house sees China as a threat to the West. Now, it wasn't saying that that's what we believed. That was, the, that was a question. Up for on, debate. On, on one side, we had the former Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rifkind. Uh, on the other side, we invited uh, a woman by the name of Anastasia Lin. Now, she's someone who's been expelled from China for her human rights mm. activism. Um, she's a former Miss World contestant who's a, a great speaker. But we started getting loads of complaints uh, into, the, into my inbox from Chinese students at Durham University, and they started to say, uh, why are you hosting this debate? Why have you invited Anastasia Lin? She is banned from China. You can't host this woman. You can't host her. You can't have her well, they copy in your and paste debate. Jobs. Uh, they were all very, very similar. Mm. And we were sort of thinking, well, this is a union that is hundreds of years old, founded on the principles of free speech. We're not going to listen because some students are upset. And then it got to the point where I was pulled out of a tutorial that I was in, told to go to the union office and take a phone call from the Chinese embassy. And so I was taking a phone call here from diplomats in the Chinese embassy saying, you have to cancel this debate. You have to cancel this debate. It's crazy. At one point, they even threatened the UK's trade terms with China. I think they thought that I was perhaps a representative of the British state. I wasn't. I was a student. Um, but... I ignored them and I said, no, I we're, going to, we're going to host <laughs> this debate. We hosted the debate. It was a massive success. We heard strong arguments on either side. Uh, and, uh, and frankly... You know what I... You know, it's a good thing that you were there to make sure that your university and its union upheld the values of Britain and our liberal mm. democracy. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Seven forty-five. Good morning to you. Let's see what's in the papers this morning with political commentators Andy Williams and Suzanne Evans. Good morning Good to morning. you both. Good morning. Andy, let's have a look at the Times. They're looking at this. Um, it's a YouGov poll, isn't it? This new one, which sees a whole load of of uh, the cabinet being booted out of politics. Yeah. Um, 
uh, the, which is what they call poor Michael Portillo of this parish, because they called it the a Portillo moment. Because yeah. it was big news when he went back in the day. When was that? Ninety two or ninety seven? Uh, it 97. was ninety seven. Yeah. Yes, when they when a whole load of wiped his... out. Is this going to happen again? I suspect. Yeah. I think it probably is. And and this po this MRP poll, which is a kind of mega poll that that with a very big sample size, suggests that Labour on course for uh, a, a you know a a roughly 97 style majority, maybe slightly bigger. I mean, we kind of know this. There have been lots of similar polls that predict a wipeout. I think the interesting thing about this poll is two things. Firstly, it shows that Rishi Sunak is going backwards versus where he was at the start of the year. Mm. So either people don't feel like things are getting better, that their you know, uh, financial circumstances are improving, etc., or he's not getting the credit for it. But either way, it's grim reading for mm. the Tories. And secondly, it's predicting that most of the household name cabinet ministers we know of are going to lose their seats. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, Penny Mordaunt, Mark Harper, Grant Shapps, all of these people mm. predicted to lose their seats, which firstly will be really embarrassing for, for them to make a real statement, but also changes the dynamics of the Conservative leadership race after the election. Yes, um, yeah. Rishi isn't looking so dishy anymore, is he? <laughs> Do you remember his uh, leadership campaign slogan, are you ready for Rishi? Are you ready for the complete obliteration of the Conservative Party, mm. more like it's turning out to be? So, yeah, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> the plan is working, he keeps saying. Well, this clearly shows it's not. OK, let's be honest. Are you rubbing honest. your hands in glee well, or not? Well, I thought of Jeremy Hunt going, yeah, I think I probably am, to be honest, <laughs> not my favourite uh, politician. But, OK, let's be honest, only one poll matters, and that's the one that you tick on the ballot box on the day of the general election. And, of course, we still don't know when that's going to be happening. So, and any time is a short time in politics. Things could change. But, my goodness, they are up against it now. Like I said, it is looking like it's going to be a 1997-style wipeout. You've got reform at 12 per cent in the polls as well, coming up, snapping at the, the Tory vote in, in the Red Wall and, and, and in some traditional well, working-class Labour. what's it going to do? Well, it's mm. going to deprive... I think both parties have votes. I, I don't think it's just the Conservatives. I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, Labour people who are increasingly disillusioned with the Labour Party. It's strayed so far away now for its working class roots. It no longer represents the working man and woman. I don't think it's become part of the Liberal elite, just like other, other parties. So they are going to make a difference to the electoral landscape. Are they going to get any seats? Um, almost certainly not, unless we have a situation where an MP defects to reform, um, as Douglas Carswell and Mark Reckless did, um, and both won seats, Mark Reckless only in the by-election, but then Douglas Carswell for UKIP again in the didn't general election. Well, did do them well in the Not in the long, long run. run, no. But, of course, that was all about Brexit. So, yeah. arguably, it was a so, slightly uh, different is it, is it uh, landscape. Is it down to a point, then, where... And as someone who's, say, you were deputy chair, mm. weren't you, with UKIP, mm. um, is vote for reform now, in effect, a vote for Labour? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's a vote against the Conservative Party. But it's going to disproportionately before, hurt the Tory party. I think it probably will, but I don't think it's about Labour winning the next general election. If the general election were held mm. tomorrow, it's not about Labour winning it, it's about the Tories losing it, because they've been such a disaster, frankly. And what do you think, Suzanne, this means to the Tory leadership post-election? Well, that's a very interesting question. It depends who's around, because, of course, you can only have a Conservative Party leader who is a member of Parliament under the terms of their constitution. So it's who's left still to stand. Wow. Uh, to yes. see. Um, should we have a look at this uh, 100 millilitre liquid rule? Mm. So if you're getting on a plane, you know you've got to have your, your travel-size bottles of Awful. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be getting. It was meant to disappear, wasn't it? Down to a, up to a litre or it two litres. I was sort of so excited about this. As somebody who checked in late for a flight from Inverness once and couldn't check her bag, oh dear, and literally had to unpack all my toiletries, plus a load of toiletries I'd bought as presents for people, just to see them go in the bin, I was devastated, because I'm clearly not a terrorist, and they were clearly proper liquids, you know, and no harm done. So I was so excited about this rule. Um, there was always a problem about whether or not airports could get the scanners in place quick enough. They've now decided that they can't install them quickly enough, so it's been put back for another year. Oh, it is airport. such a pain if you've ever tried to get your stuff them, in those little bags. Some I mean, airports have got 
Gotham. City, city Airport. airport. Gotham. Yeah. Oh, lovely. What a lovely airport city is. It's <laughs> a how privilege can, to travel how through. can City Airport, which is tiny, get them when the big airport's coming? Why. That's why it's the, it's the, it's the scale. It's and the scale. Heathrow and yeah. Gatwick, they've really struggled to... I mean, it's another infrastructure triumph for, uh, for, for Britain this year, pushed back by another year. I mean, I read this morning, I didn't realise, do you know how long this has been in place for, this rule? Oh, it's since 9-11, isn't it? Since 2006 it came, Oh, it's before... Apparently. It's no, nearly 20 years. It was, it, because... it was the shoe bomber, wasn't it? Was that, that the shoe bomber? There was that, right. and then there was somebody who tried to smuggle explosives in a fizzy drinks bottle. Mm. Mm. And then they introduced it in 2000. So it's taken nearly 20 years to get to the point where we've had the technology to actually stop us having to take all of our stuff out of our bags, but, yeah. Oh, yeah, mm. and be able to leave your laptop in your bag as well with these new scanners, mm. which is a... Which I'm cool. always leaving it in there, and then you see, you know you see that over. horrible <laughs> moment when it stops, and you think, oh no, oh no, yeah, it's going to go wipe down all my there. stuff. That's oh, all. I know oh, they yeah. don't, but it's always the fear, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's always me as well. The profiteering as well, going in in the, in the shops and the airports. Yeah. You know, we have to buy the minis. Yeah. Yeah, it's about four pounds for a little thing of shampoo. Yeah. Yeah. And you just want to take a little bottle of water through. But, oh no, you have to pay three, four pounds oh, for one when you've got through. At least for duty free. Yes, we'll be very pleased to see the end of that. Um Andy, should we talk about AI? in terms of uh, music. Yeah, well, two really interesting uh, AI-related stories this morning, one about the threat of AI, one about the opportunity. There's this story in The Times about a letter that's been signed by loads of really famous artists, Billie Eilish, Stevie Wonder, R.E.M., and the estates of some big artists as well, who are all saying that AI-generated voices could be catastrophic for songwriters who are trying to make ends meet. So not necessarily for these guys who are multimillionaires, but for the, you know, the everyday songwriter who's struggling to get by. Because what it's doing is taking people's intellectual property, their voice, their uh, talent, and sort of reusing those voices and turning it into new songs. So yeah. it's a big threat to the music industry, actually. So what's Google going to do about it? I don't know what Google... I mean, I assume Google are probably trying to profit, profit, it, profit it from it, but um, I, I don't think there is really any solution on the table at the moment. But there's an interesting story in the FT about the opportunity that Google's trying to seize around search. So it's looking at potentially introducing a new level of Google search that would be premium behind the payroll wall uh, and driven by AI. So faster, more sophisticated, more powerful search. Mm. Mm. Are you impressed it's, by this, Suzanne? I, I, AI is an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, it's obviously the future. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The tech is racing away, massive amounts of investment going into it. What's it going to look like ultimately? Uh, plenty of arguments. It's going to lead to job losses. The intellectual property issues are very much to the fore. It's a brave new world, but it's... Whether it's one I'm going to like, I think, remains to be seen. Is it one that we're going to have to just get used to? We're not going to be able to... Start. It's like Pandora's yeah, box. It is, absolutely. But, of course, there is a lot of talk about legislation, and uh, Rishi Sunak's famously had his AI summit. Um, but, of course, whether the big players like China are going to take notice of any globally agreed treaties, or whether they're going to even sign up to them, is another matter. So it is a new frontier. It's, it's like any of these big things, the Industrial Revolution, the advance of the Internet, telecommunications, they are world changing. Mm. I think well, the, yeah, they are. The real issue here is that the big tech companies, as always, are miles ahead of governments yeah. in terms of their capability. Yeah. Yeah. They also have uh, more money than most nation states. You know, the amount of money that Apple, Google, Microsoft are throwing at this mm -hmm. is enormous because they don't want to lose their, their dominant position where, you know, it's... It, it seems crazy to think that Google might not be the search engine we all use today yeah. in 10 years' time, but there's yeah, no reason knows? why it will. The other uh, thing is tech, tech, tech is always above the ethics. Yeah, we're out of yeah. time, sadly. Andrew, Suzanne, thank you very much. Here's the weather. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers. And in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north. Most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland.
More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. Fred chance to win a prize worth over £20,000. Text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. In Kent, the westbound M2, two lanes are closed. There's been an accident this morning from Junction 3 for Chatham and Rochester to Junction 2 for Strood. In Surrey, the anti-clockwise M25, big problems here, I'm afraid. This road is closed. There's been an accident between Junction 6 for Godston and 5 for the M26. Queues back to the M23 at Junction 7. That's very slow northbound towards Hooley and people are slowing down clockwise as well, causing queues from Junction 5 for the M26. Let's look at Berkshire, the eastbound M4. We've got a lane blocked by a broken down car. That's between Junction 11 for Reading and Junction 10 for Wokingham and Bracknell. And in Cambridgeshire, the A428 westbound remains blocked by an accident at the Camborne Junction. There's more in half an hour. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my person? argument for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock on Thursday the 4th of April. Today, the Prime Minister threatens to sever ties with the European Court of Human Rights over his Rwanda plan. Yes, Rishi Sunak desperate to get people on flights to Rwanda two years after the scheme was first announced. He's hinting now if that means pulling out of the ECHR, he is prepared to go there. A Labour landslide. A new poll reveals Tories could suffer the worst election defeat on record, with Sir Keir Starmer's party predicted to win 400 seats. New guidelines reveal judges should consider more lenient sentences for criminals from disadvantaged backgrounds, but that's raising concerns about a divide with the better off. 
The world's central kitchen founder claims Israeli forces targeted his aid workers systematically, as former top judges say arming Israel breaches international law. And in the sports news this morning, Manchester City score four against Aston Villa with a Phil Foden hat-trick. Arsenal beat Luton last night to go back to the top of the Premier League, but Liverpool play bottom club Sheffield United tonight, and should they win, as you'd expect them to, then they'll go top again. That makes sense. Morning. Watch out for some heavy, possibly thundery downpours in the southeast first thing this morning. Otherwise, there'll be a few showers around and feeling pleasantly warm in any bright or sunny spells. I'll have the forecast later. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Oh, on the ECHR, which we're going to talk about in a second, Kate's been in touch. Morning mm. to you, Kate. Said um, the Prime Minister could have come out of the ECHR months or years ago but he's waited until now when he's doing very badly at the polls. Mm. But that's an indication he doesn't really want to do it, which is no, which is no great surprise, mm. I think. Um, but he wants to be seen to be doing something to get the Rwanda planes off the ground. Well, if they, if they don't, that's what he's pinned everything on. I don't know that it's going to make any difference now. Mm. Mm. When you look at that latest poll... Mm. Well, on that, uh, we have one on the poll. Let's see what we can do. Oh, you've just read it. There you go. Um, the Conservatives, Leon says, the Conservatives, especially Rishi Sunak, have lost all credibility regarding immigration. And we were also talking to Jonathan Reynolds of the Labour Party earlier on. There's mm -hmm. lots of you reacting to that. Uh, David said, what would Labour do to stop the boats? Well, he did address that. He did. David. Um, it, I think it's a bit vague. Mm. We're sort of saying you, you need to improve the processing and all that sort of thing. I don't know how that... Stopping them before they come to... Before they even get on a boat. Well, processing offshore. No, no, no. It was all about processing over here. Oh, right. But getting it up, but making it much faster, then you're getting people out of hotels. It's, you know, if they're not meant to be here, then they'll be deported. The problem with that is deported to where? Because the idea of, well, you send them back to their country, you've got to have a returns agreement, and they're not just there. We've got one with Albania now. I mean, if it was that easy, we'd be doing it. Would have been done by now. So I'm not entirely convinced by what Labour is saying about that at this stage. There's just not enough detail, which is, of course, the, the complaint being made about Labour, is that we're not getting enough detail as yet. And that's exactly what Ron says, saying Labour uh, cannot answer how they'd actually deport failed asylum seekers. It's easy to criticise when you are not in power. Well, can I have to have the detail in a manifesto, though? So they must have some plans. I guess what they don't want to do is, is give the government those plans just yet. So we'll find out when the manifestos have been published, which won't happen, of course, until the election is called. Mm. It is sitting there waiting to go, though, so we understand. Mm. Um, but we shall have to wait and see. Uh, it, it's interesting that did you you read that one, didn't you? Saying the Rishi Sunak lost all yeah. credibility regarding immigration. Yeah. Well, he's trying to claim it back because by suggesting at least that he will pull out of the European Court of Human Rights if it stands in the way of the Rwanda plan. Well, Rishi Sunak said that controlling illegal immigration is more important than membership of the legal body, and he would not let a foreign court interfere in sovereign affairs. There's arguments as to whether it is a foreign court or not. We helped set it up. Um, some of the judges are British as a result of all of that. But anyway, that's another debate. Let's talk to our political co uh, correspondent, Catherine Forster, who's in Westminster for us. I mean, the issue with all of this, Catherine, is that we know the Prime Minister doesn't really want to do this and we know there's a significant number of Tories who don't want to do it either. I think that's exactly right, Stephen, and that is why he hasn't pledged it yet and it really would be his sort of last option, the nuclear option, if you like, if he does, in fact, feel that he has to go there because he thought he could get people on these flights uh, before. They've spent two years from announcing it still. Hundreds of millions given to Rwanda, not a single migrant. The safety of Rwanda bill uh, still going through Parliament um, and he's hopeful of getting flights off in the spring. But if there is a court challenge and bear in mind that the um, the European court has blocked this before, as indeed have British courts, 
he is indicating that, yes, he would be prepared to say we need to withdraw. That potentially would be a manifesto pledge for the general election. But as you say, that would be very, very divisive. First of all, within his own party, there's plenty on the right and people like the former Home Secretary, so Ala Braverman, saying, well, this is obvious that we need to do this and we should have done this already. But there's plenty more, more moderate, more centrist Conservative MPs, especially among the One Nation group, who would be absolutely horrified at this. Um, some cabinet ministers who potentially might resign. And in terms of voters, there'll be plenty of voters, maybe some of those toying with going to reform, who will think, yes, this is what we have to do. This is a great idea. But there'll be many others who, again, would think that this is absolutely the wrong step to take and they might be pushed straight into the arms of the Liberal Democrats. And, Catherine, this all comes as a new poll suggests that the Tories could suffer the worst election defeat on record. Yes, another day, another horrendous poll if you're a Conservative MP. We had one at the weekend saying... Uh, projecting the Conservatives to only get 98 seats. This is slightly better, but only slightly, saying they'd get 155. But Labour projected to get 403. So we really are looking, potentially, at a 1997-style landslide for Sir Keir Starmer. Lib Dems on 12% projected 49 seats reform, 12% projected no seats at all, but potentially costing the Conservatives a lot. So it's quite a turnaround for Sir Keir Starmer because it's just four years since he became leader of the Labour Party. At the time, it looked like he was going to have to be a sort of caretaker leader because Labour seemed to be in such a, a mess that it was thought it would take them at least a decade to make themselves electable. Again, um, things have really changed dramatically. I've taken a look back over the last four years. Let's have a look at that now. A changed Labour Party on the march, on your side, return to the service of working people. Things can always change, and fast. But current polling predicts a huge Labour majority. How times change. Four years ago, Starmer took over a Labour Party smarting from its worst defeat since 1935. Cumulatively, we lost the trust of the public in the Labour Party as a force for good and a force for change. And we've lost four general elections. Despite calls for a first female leader, the party plumped for another man from North London. On a platform of ten left-wing pledges, making, he said, the moral case for socialism. Few of those pledges remain intact. But Baroness Jenny Chapman, who was Starmer's political secretary, explains. So things that he said four years ago, before we'd left the European Union, before COVID, before the financial crisis that Liz Truss plunged, plunged us into as a country, before our mortgages all went through the roof, things you could say then, you know, it's just not pragmatic or realistic to say the exact same things now. Starmer's determination to root out the anti-Semitism that had surged under Corbyn led to a zero-tolerance approach and quickly high-profile figures being sacked or losing the whip, including the former leader himself. Changing the party hasn't been easy. When Labour lost the Hartlepool by-election to the Tories in May 2021, Starmer came close to resigning. The ensuing reshuffle aimed to clip the wings of deputy leader Angela Rayner, but ended with her gaining a whole host of titles. But weeks later, the Partygate scandal began to break and Labour passed the Tories in the polls. Boozy parties in Downing Street. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Yes. As the Conservatives have swapped one Prime Minister for another and another, against a backdrop of high taxes and stretched public services. The Labour lead has only grown. Here's Scarlett Maguire, pollster at JL Partners. And one thing that Keir Starmer has managed to do is make himself and the party look like a safe option again, especially around issues like immigration and the economy. And his numerous U-turns on policy 
have been seized on by the Tories. Now he seems to be opposing that policy. It's only Wednesday. I know he flip-flops, but even for him it's pretty quick. The war in Gaza has led to rebellions and the humiliation of George Galloway winning Rochdale. But Starmer is focused on acting like a prime minister in waiting. We actually recently asked voters to describe Keir Starmer in a single word, uh, and the most commonly used words were weak, uh, boring, unsure. People also use words like honest and competent and leader. And I think one thing that we hear more and more from people is that actually the more they see of him, at least they think he might be a little bit more um, normal than Rishi Sunak. Something we hear a lot, we hear, we don't know what Keir Starmer stands for. We're not sure what the Labour Party stands for, but they must be better than what we've just had for the last 14 years, so we're going to give them a go. In just four years, Sir Keir Starmer has dragged the Labour Party back towards the centre and to the edge of power. Catherine Forster, GB News. Yes, so the least worst option, hardly a ringing endorsement, but my goodness, what a turnaround. He looks now like he's heading to be our next Prime Minister by the end of the year. And really, he's been quite ruthless in pursuit of power because the pledges that he made to get elected have changed very dramatically to where we are now. He wants to win, and despite the very mild manners, it looks very much at the moment like he's going to. OK, Catherine, for now, thank you. Now, judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived backgrounds. Yeah, the Sentencing Council has, for the first time, explained the mitigating factors that include poverty, low educational attainment, experience of discrimination and insecure housing. Well, earlier we spoke to former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley about this. She's always have done and they always will do. They do not need it laying out from a body, the Sentencing Council, formed in 2010, which, with this ridiculous set of guidelines, has just shown how unfit for purpose it is. Judges, take these factors into account. This is deeply insulting to anybody who was born into poverty, who was not particularly academic, who went on to make a decent living, uh, contributing to society. And quite frankly, it's just shown that this council that was established in 2010 is not fit for purpose and should be abolished forthwith. And, it, you know, Peter, depending on whatever background you're from, whether that's upper class, whether it's whether you're born into poverty, you should know the difference between right and wrong, surely? Absolutely, and we should all be judged as equals in the eyes of the law. But this just flies in the face of all that. And let's look at the broader picture here. In the UK, sadly, our streets are becoming increasingly lawless. We have an absolute epidemic of shoplifting and assaults on uh, retail staff. There's massive increase in violent crime. Car crime is, is dreadful, burglary. None of these are being investigated. Nobody's being caught. So on those occasions when people are arrested, charged, put in front of a court and convicted, what, what are people going to do now? They're simply going to say, I came from a tough background, life was hard for me, so please give me a lesser sentence. There are no deterrents these days, which is why, sadly, crime does pay. You say this highlights the need to basically get rid of the sentencing council, but isn't it necessary, Peter? I mean, it's, it, 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 to provide those guidelines so that judges up and down the country are, are sentencing in a similar way? It's these guidelines that have led to so many sentences that have had the public and the media up in arms in recent years. This body was only formed 14 years ago. It's not like it's cemented into the very heart and soul of our judiciary. And having been in many, many courts and in front of many, many judges as a witness, I hasten to add, rather than a defendant, I've always uh, erred on the side of trusting the wisdom of judges to come to their decisions. It is judges who hear all the facts of a case and not the sentencing council. So I think this kind of prescriptive uh, instructions that are being handed down are damaging. They tie the hands of judges very often and consequently people do not receive the suitable punishments that they should. Mm. Do you fear that this will 
excuse criminality. Yes, and that's why it's so deeply insulting to people like me who, who, who came from a, a, a rather impoverished background, please forgive me, um, who came from a rather impoverished background, didn't achieve particularly well at school, and then went on to live a law-abiding life. It's so, so insulting to people to just say, well, if, you're, if your start in life is difficult, then we'll understand if you go off and have a life of crime. Utterly insulting. Mm, keep your thoughts coming through on that. Loads of you getting in touch saying, you know, you know right from wrong. Uh, Martin says judges have got their priorities wrong. The British justice system is backwards. Um, uh, Denise says it's not an excuse being deprived uh, to commit a crime. I was brought up in the 60s and 70s. There were six of us with a single parent. We certainly knew right from wrong. And not one of me or my siblings got into trouble. Everything is a soft touch these days. We worked for what we wanted and it is an achievement. Mm. Well, it is an achievement. It is an achievement, and I think you're right, you can't just say... Do you know what my issue is? I know it won't be popular with a lot of you. It's, um, it's the fact that it's very easy... If, if you're from a crime-free background, it's very easy to look at people who've committed crimes and go, well, they're what terrible, terrible people. And I think that's... Because you're not, you're not as bad as your worst decision. That shouldn't define the rest of your life. Mm. Then I do some work with people once they've come out of prison. It's one of the, some of the, the stuff I do on the side. And it's... Um, and you get a different insight into it. And when you look at their backgrounds... Some of the, when you look at their backgrounds, some have had the most horrific backgrounds. And it, it does give you a bit more sense. But as, that should be taken into account in mitigating factors by the judge. Well, the it's idea, already, isn't it? The, the, yeah. The idea that it's... Um, you know, needs to be laid out by the sentencing council. Mm. I don't know. I'm not a soft on crime type. I'm really not. But it doesn't mean these people who've committed crimes are necessarily icky, wicked and evil people. Because mm. then, then some are, but not all. Mm. Not all. Well, do let us know what you think about that story, or indeed any of the stories that we're talking about today. GB views at gbnews.com. I can feel the nasty tweets coming on, arriving on my oh, no. Twitter feed. Well, some people, you know. Or throw away well, you key. believe in rehabilitation. I do, I do. You've got, to, you've got to get back into society and make a positive contribution. I think a lot of people agree with that. Yeah, I hope so. Let us anyway, know. Do let us know. Uh, what is not making a positive contribution at the moment is the weather. Mm. At least it wasn't first thing this morning. Will it change today? Here's Alex. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers. And in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north. Most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, it's our biggest giveaway of the year so far. Your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise for two, but that is not all, is it? No, just emphasise that again. 
A £10,000 Greek cruise for two, but that's imagine, not all. Imagine £10,000 cruise. Yeah. Oh. And it doesn't even look like a cruise ship, as you're about to see. It looks like a yacht. Oh, anyway, £10,000 in cash on top of that and a whole host of luxury travel gifts. Yes, your 2025 holiday could be on us. So here's all the details you need to enter. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Now, are farmers better off, or were they better off, in the EU? Oh, it's controversial. We'll debate it in just a moment. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. Danny, there's an irony here, isn't there? And that is this. Um, on the one hand, the BBC expects older viewers to cough up more, and yet every opinion poll of the land shows us, Danny, that older people are the least satisfied with the service they get. Well, the BBC don't give a damn about older people because... As I discovered when I was binned for being 50 and white from the BBC in the Midlands to diversify the lineup, they're after a younger audience because the longevity of the institution, that's the BBC, Martin, relies on the next generation of licence fee payers. And this is quite important, and it's a great point that you've raised. Anybody who's over the age of 50, certainly 60, the BBC just doesn't care about you because they're interested in, in attracting the next generation of licence fee payers. And when those 25-year-olds that they're after at the moment become 40 and 45, they'll stop caring about them too. Otherwise, the BBC just won't exist. It relies on new, uh, new blood, if you like, when it comes to the licence fee. So that's a great point. They just don't care about middle-aged people. And yet, they're, they're now floating the idea of older people paying more. How would that work? Would it be means-tested? I know. If ever, you, if ever you wanted to satisfy your curiosity that the BBC had a socialist agenda, it's the fact that they, they, they want the proletariat to pay more, sorry, to, to not pay, and the bourgeoisie to pick up the bill. This is classic Marxism for you. I know we're, we're, we're treating this lightly, Martin, but how would they means test you? Are you going to have to provide evidence of your bank account? And, of course, people's financial situation, they change. You know, people's finances are fluid. So one year you may be what they class as, as wealthy, and then the next year you're not. So it's, mm. it's, a, it's a situation that I find just impossible. How it's going to work, I, I just don't know. It's something that I just don't feel happy about. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. 
only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now, British farmers have launched a campaign to demand universal basic income for agricultural workers. It's a bid to improve financial security in the sector. Well, before Brexit, farmers were heavily relied on EU subsidies, but now the government are having to replace this with other schemes. Well, according to a new report, the systems won't actually plug the gap that's going to be left as part of the transition. Well, GB News' Northern Ireland reporter, Doogie Beattie, joins us now. Very good morning to you, Doogie. Good morning, and good morning from a, a farm outside Lisburn. You can just see the calves getting their breakfast there behind me. Uh, but, yes, we're... Uh, th this has been quite an issue for farming uh, throughout the UK. Of course, after Brexit happened, the, the single farm payment, as it was known then, was a subsidy for farmers in order to produce food, and that food, of course, came to us with subsidies in place in it. Now, in Northern Ireland, because of the protocol, we managed to uh, lessen that subsidy what but farming input costs have been up by about 35 percent over the last two years i mean we at gb news said about the price of milk going down we said about the price of fertilizer going up we said about the potato crop failing all these things it's not because we have a magic ball it's because we look at farming as a business and decide uh you know, when we do the maths on that and have a look at it, we say, OK, that's going to fail, that's not. And that may well be the problem to start off with, that in those negotiations after Brexit, that it was maybe people that weren't inside the industry that were doing the negotiations on behalf of the farmers. And I'm joined now by the former Agriculture Minister for Northern Ireland, Edwin Putz. Edwin, how bad is it on farms at the moment? It's been an unusually wet spring, so there are costs for straw, uh, for bedding the animals here, um, our cost for silage for feeding the animals has doubled over the course of the last few, few, few months. And what farmers actually need is support in these crisis times as opposed to some universal benefit. Farmers are businesses, they're small businesses, they need to promote efficiency, they need to have good animal welfare and they need government to actually to help them at a point of need, not some benefit which will be spread across across everyone and actually uh, encourage inefficiency. Was it the case that uh, in those negotiations after Brexit that civil servants didn't seem to realise how farming worked and maybe a more environmental lobby was in place? Yeah, but the environmental lobby was an illogical lobby, what they were pressing for, and as a consequence of that, Britain, which should have full security both in energy and food, uh, is, is falling well short of that, and the British public have been sold short. So we've been buying gas from Russia, we've been buying oil from, 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 from the Middle East, and we're buying food from all over the world. Whenever we have our own gas and oil in the North Sea, and whenever we've been producing our own food in Britain, it is entirely illogical for the government not to provide security both in energy and food. But you were in those negotiations. You had to deal with trying to get the best for farmers here in Northern Ireland. I mean, how hard was it? How, how much of an understanding did those civil servants actually have? Um, a lot of the Northern Ireland civil servants would probably have a better understanding because we're closer to agriculture in Northern Ireland. But little Northern Ireland produces over 10% of the food for all of the United Kingdom. And if you look at the landmass of the United Kingdom, there are so many opportunities to ensure that you can look after the environment on the one hand, but also feed the nation on the other. And that's what we should be doing as opposed to importing uh, food from other countries, which produces uh, that food at a higher carbon level than farmers in Britain do. Well, there you go. Uh, that came from a man that was in those negotiations. And we can tell you that this is very much like the old song, The Woman Who Swallowed a Fly. At the end of it, it didn't go well for her. And unless uh, farmers, there is an input from the industry itself into legislation and regulation, that may become worse. OK, Doogie, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's debate it now with uh, James Fairley, who's a potato farmer, and Dennis McShane, former Labour Minister of State for Europe, uh, who's here in the studio. Good to see you both this morning. Dennis, explain this to us in, in, in a way that is going to make... Well, if, if you're a farmer, if you're involved in the business, this is all very relevant. For the rest of us, we, we don't quite understand what's going on. Oh, I think we do. I mean, the coverage of farming, I've been doing European politics for decades, and it's a number one issue in Europe. I agree in Britain, it 
isn't. And it would have been much more helpful if Mr Poots, as former First Minister of Northern Ireland, had actually told the truth to Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage that leaving the European Union would be devastating for farmers and for fisher, fishers, fishermen, fisherwomen. I've got lots of stats, and I'm sure uh, Mr Fairley has as well, that it's just devastated export markets. We've lost all the subsidies. And believe me, the gentlemen of Whitehall don't give a monkeys about farmers. Europeans did. So perhaps we could just have our farming industry back in the EU and all will be better. Mm. Mm. James, let's bring you in on this one. I mean, how bad is it on farms at the moment? Because if you look across Europe as well, it must be tough there because we've seen the, the farmers protest in, in Holland and in France too. Well, exactly. Um, you know, it's not all a bed of roses in Europe. It's actually worse because you see them protesting a lot harder than we are. I mean, we've... Uh, I mean, Dennis, I, I have to go back you talking about we don't get any subsidies well we're still getting our full subsidy our export markets are still open and um, the seed industry has been very tight this year uh, for potatoes in scotland because the seed's just not there and we're doing a lot of exporting so in terms of um receiving subsidy why should an industry like ours have to survive on the back of getting a subsidy can we not just survive and actually getting paid a fair price for what we do Oh, Dennis, I mean, that's a great well, point. It, it's, a, it's a great point. I mean, I'd love to have a fair price for appearing on GB News, but I have to accept what they're prepared to pay me, you get one. Jim. <laughs> uh, and oh, probably it's an over-generous one. It, it's a boring thing called the market. We all like it. We don't want to spend more on cars to pay for... You know, car workers, as it were. But in general, in Europe, I mean, I, I know I follow all these uh, problems uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe, and the French farmers, I lived in France for 15 years, believe me, James, Jim, if I may, they, go, they do that every winter. It's a regular winter ritual of the tractors dumping the dung in front of the local politicians' offices. But that said, for the number of people on farms has declined dramatically, the investment isn't going into farming. But I was in France, sort of a seaside resort, a bit like Brighton, if you like, uh, over the Easter weekend with grandchildren. And there, all that their supermarkets put local produce at the front of the store. They really promote French food. Does Asda do that? Does Tesco do that? Does Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's just across the road from here in GB News? No. And we should do far more to support our farmers in Britain like they do in the continent. But you won't find a Tory minister who's interested in looking again at this. This is the worst failure of Brexit. There are many other failures, uh, but this is the worst one. Uh, and you're right to say it's cost us great damage. And I don't know if anybody's got the guts to try and put it right. James, we are almost out of time, so just last word to you. Yeah, just on that, you know, what you're saying there, Dennis, doesn't really back up being in the e EU because actually what we're doing is we're making it harder for imports to come in from the EU. So we are supporting British farmers. We have more British produce on the shelves now. What we have to stop is the imports from Australia and New Zealand of cheaper lamb and beef. Ooh. That's a bigger issue. They're not even part of the EU. I mean, we, we don't want to get run by people in Brussels telling us how to farm our land here. That, that, that just doesn't work by self-elected people. Poor, okay, look, poor, poor Aussies. Oh, poor New Zealanders. Well, we're out of time. Uh, it's good to talk to you both this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Now, do stay with us because Paul Coit is going to be in the studio and he'll be speaking to Olympic swimmer Mark Foster. That's next. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. In Kent, the westbound M2, we've got a heavy delay here after an accident. That's from Junction 3 for Chatham and Rochester to Junction 2 for Strood. Big problems in Surrey. The anti-clockwise M25 is closed this morning. That's down to a serious accident between Junction 6 for Godston and 5 for the M26. Queues back to the M23 at Junction 7. Clockwise, we've got people slowing down to have a look. We've got a delay from a couple of miles before Junction 25. 
five. Uh, Hampshire now the M two seven one southbound. A lane is blocked by an accident at the M twenty seven junction three for Southampton Docks to junction one for Nursling. That is causing some heavy delays coming along that stretch as well. There's more in thirty minutes. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What are you doing? <laughs> Oh, sorry. He's trying get your hands to... off He's her fingers. I was, I was trying to get... get your hands off her well, fingers. We've been talking about all these fancy holidays that you can win in our giveaway, and I thought, well, that would pay for a nice holiday. Well, and now it's stuck. So I was, trying to get it, I was trying to get it off. I flogged that for the <laughs> fortune. Well, we anyway. can't enter the giveaway, but you but, can. So good luck. But, it won't, yeah, it won't come off. Yeah. It's on there. <sighs> Staying on. Better look next time. Fetch yeah. some soap in. Next yeah, I'll time. bring soap in. Yeah, we'll have that, we'll have that thing off in no time. Um, all right. Get away, you two. Sports, please. Yes. Sports, right? um, great swim. With it, the, the British Olympic trials are on at the moment um, for the Olympics, obviously. How many swimmers, great swimmers over the years? I'm thinking of great swimmers that we've had over the hours. See if I can help you out. Duncan Going... Goodhue. Duncan Goodhue Adam is... Adam Peaty. Adam Peaty. Anita Lonsborough. There's another one. Oh. Uh, Mark ha Foster, obviously. Mark Foster, and also, do you remember David Wilkie, 1976 Olympics? You won't remember. No, I was too. Little then. Tash, because he, he had the... It was almost like the Mark Spitz moustache, and I always wondered that if you're swimming, does the moustache, you know... You know it would do now. ..slow you down slightly? It's be all aerodynamic. About, it is. They all shave it's about all legs and everything yeah. now and their armpits and the whole shebang, don't they? Well, I thought we may speak a little professional swimming. Oh, should we? And talk about Adam Peaty. The man, well, five-time Olympian, six-time world champion, eight-time world record holder and no moustache to be seen, Mark Foster. Morning, Mark. <laughs> Good morning, how are we doing? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I never grew enough facial hair to have a moustache. I mean, would it cut through the water easily? I think of Spitz back in 72 and Wilkie in 76. You know, it was all very stylish, but well, it couldn't help the swimming, surely. Yeah. Well, I think it, as, as over the decades and things changed an awful lot, we, we, we became, uh, became evident that less was better. And I'm not saying a little moustache would have made a huge amount of difference. It might have made one hundredth of a second difference. It might have made no difference. But if it made one hundredth of a second difference, we all know that's the difference between breaking records and winning medals, so it would have made a difference. But then back then, they didn't wear swim hats, so obviously the hair was out. Yep. Uh, and also they had probably not the most streamlined swimwear at the same time. So things have changed an awful lot and developed. 
They have. And, and actually, when we t I didn't think this would be a swimming facial hair interview, but <laughs> even so, Adam Peaty, though, did wear the moustache for a while. But I do want to talk about Adam Peaty because he's back swimming well again, and it has been a tough three years for Adam, hasn't it? Yeah, he, he, well, he won the Olympics for the second time. It's never been done by a British swimmer before, probably British athlete either. Uh, and he wanted some time out. Uh, I think he sort of talked openly about his sort of struggles. Yeah. Um, you know, where do you go from when you set out to become Olympic champion, then you do it, then you do it again, and you kind of go, well, where do I go now? I'm, I'm sort of unbeatable. But to go through on the trot would be amazing. He took some time out. He did Strictly Come Dancing. He did some other things. He sort of found himself a little bit, I think, found a little bit of motivation again. Uh, and now he's getting back towards his best, but he won't have his, uh, his own way when it comes to the Olympics. There's a Chinese swimmer that won the Worlds last year that was very, very quick. Um, but it's good to see him smiling, happy, and potentially back to being the best Adam PT he can be. Because this is going to be the hardest thing, isn't it? I mean, it's one thing when you're on that program and you're on that train of just heading towards the Olympics every time, but then to stop and then start again, surely if he wins in Paris, this would be just the greatest achievement ever, wouldn't it? Yeah, three, three Olympics on the trot. I mean, you, you kind of forget, or maybe you don't, maybe, but I, I, I do. Um, he's, he's 29 years of age. Uh, and, and he could potentially go another Olympics if he wants to. I mean, I didn't retire till, till 38 years of age because basically I love what I did and I didn't want it to finish. But if he goes through on the trot, he'll only be 29 years of age. Potentially he's got more in the tank. He, he can continue if he likes to. But it's, it, listen, it's an amazing story from, from achieving it once to twice, potentially three times. Um, he seems so much happier. So he's, 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 he didn't give birth, sorry, but he's had a child. Mm. Uh, I know he's in a new relationship now. Uh, he just seems in a different place. And I think, the night, you know, throughout life, we all go through different stages of our life, so to speak. And uh, we're sort of seeing a different side of him, I think. I think a little bit of a softer side. I don't think he'll be soft when he gets in the water. I think that, that killer instinct is still there. Um, but it's nice seeing another side of Adam. One more thing, and that is, I imagine, straight after the Olympics, that must be the most difficult time for any athlete because, you know, you've got four years to go, although it's three years in this case. That must be... There's always a... There must be a lull, right, straight after winning a major championship like that. Yeah, because you, you sort of, everything's geared around. I mean, in, in, in athletics terms, you know, minus, min, minority sport terms, the Olympics is the be-all and end-all. So it's a four-year period. It finishes, you let your hair down, let's say, it goes, you go through... Uh, Olympics is end of July... End of August, you're kind of going, OK, another four-year cycle. OK, it's break, broken down. Every year, you've got a World Championships, a European Championships, a Commonwealth Games. So there's a yeah. yearly goal. But the ultimate aim, and what every swimmer wants to do when they, when they first sort of represent their countries, is go to the Olympic Games, is win an Olympic medal, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I, we all look at things in different ways. I looked at it in terms of swimming is a game. Yeah. And as kids, we all love playing games, and that's why we got into sport in the first place. And I kind of like, I, I felt very lucky that sport or a game was my living. So I kind of just sure. every day was was a blessing in a sense. But yeah, it's hard to pick yourself up. And it's ultimately, any athlete will tell you every day they're beating themselves up physically. Mark? They're trying to push their body to extremes. We're going to have to leave it. We're going to have to leave it there. I really appreciate your time. He right. has let his hair down or is his case, or they in the old days, let their moustache down, was well, the way they used to do it back in the 70s. <laughs> Mark, it's really good Absolutely. to speak to you. Enjoy the rest of the trials. Thanks a lot for your time. Yes, bye. Thanks very much. Mark Foster, swimming trials are at the Olympic pool in Stratford until the rest of the week, by the way. Lovely stuff. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. There you go. Right, he has managed to got the ring on. pinch the ring. So if, you want to send, if you want to send me an offer, uh, uh, then, no, then get your paws off. Tweet me. Yeah. All right, uh, we've, we've got fifty quid. We've got we've you got the papers stop. heading away in just a minute. Don't go anywhere. It's going right. Dubs and Co. Weekdays from six pm.
you think this country needs new gas power stations, apparently this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer yeah. stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always is looking ahead at actually politics aside what is genuinely the best thing for this country I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people people who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear there's a voice there that needs to be heard I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed which you don't find elsewhere it's really exciting we don't hold back we're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Let's have a quick look at the papers for you this morning with a pair of political commentators, <laughs> Andy Williams and Suzanne Evans. Good to see you both and this a morning. Pair they are. Uh, oh, indeed. Uh, let's have a look, Suzanne, mm. at the Telegraph Online. James Cleverly mm. says we cannot rely on cheap labour. No, I mean, this was one of the main arguments that I remember talking about during the Bre Brexit campaign all those years ago in 2016. You know, there was this idea that we keep importing migrants to do low-paid jobs, therefore there's more unemployment among people who are already here. And, of course, the reason this is a story today is because from today there are new salary threshold for skills, skilled workers. So now, basically, you can't come to the UK legally as a migrant to take a job unless you're earning at least 38000 700 pounds. Of course, this is part of the government's attempt to try and get legal migration down. Shocking figures, you remember. Um, 2022, 745,000 people coming <laughs> to the UK legally. Mm. Uh, Conservative Party manifesto all that way back since 2010, saying they're going to get net migration down to the tens of thousands. And here we are, 745,000. So this is the latest in, in that uh, package of measures to try and get it down. But it's got to be good, too. You know, we have people who desperately want to work in this country. Um, wages have been artificially depressed, I think, by migration. If we don't have that high migration, employers are inevitably going to have to pay more and wages are going to go up. Yeah. So let's see if it works. Oh, well. Andy, what do you it. make of it? Well, I think the important thing is we need to create better jobs in this country, higher quality jobs, better paid jobs. We need a more productive economy that's been sluggish for all of this time. And in order to do that, there needs to be a proper all-encompassing industrial strategy that looks at 
giving the economy a massive injection in the arm that it's needed for so long. Well, whereas I can see the sense in that to a degree. Mm. But what you can't... The, the implication for that is, well, you get rid of the other jobs. But the, 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 the sort of more basic jobs, if you like, are jobs which we need to be done. Absolutely. And they are very important for the economy and they'll always be there. We can't have... Uh, an economy that's 100% really highly paid, really high quality jobs. Um, but I think there are too many um, low quality jobs in this economy and it's, Britain is not working in that respect in the way that it once was. And I think we need to look at investing in the industries of the future to create better jobs for the next generation. Mm. Mm. Okay. And let's stick with you, shall we? This is the front page of The Times this morning. Um, I wouldn't date a Tory <laughs> why young women are more left-wing. Yeah, so this is some new research from The Economist that shows there's a growing ideological divide between young men and young women. So young women are now most likely to describe themselves as very liberal. They're the most progressive demographic. And according to research, we're, and anecdotally, we're seeing this bleed into the world of dating. Mm. So on dating apps, there is a growing trend to sort of state your political preferences. And if you're on the left, say, I'd never date a Tory. You might remember uh, there was a thing a few years ago where uh, Labour members were wearing Badges I've, that said, I've never yeah, kissed a Tory. Never kissed a Tory. Yeah. Exactly. So this is this is like a, a really significant phenomenon among in the world of dating, where people are kind of making decisions on who to date and not they date based on their preferences. They don't know what they're missing out on. <laughs> They don't know what they're missing out on. You only have to look at Nigel Nelson and Claire Pearsall, who we often have reviewing the papers together. Yeah. Nigel's to the left, <coughs> Claire's to the right. Happy as Larry. Yeah, I mean, that was really interesting, Andrew, to hear you say that these young women who are doing this consider themselves to be liberal. What they're actually doing is proving they're completely illiberal by being <clears throat> so discriminatory against a, a significant majority of the population. But it's interesting, this story put me in mind of several, several stories that we've had in the past based on surveys which show categorically right-wing women are more attractive. Re really? You Google, Google it, Google it. There have been How, several surveys I'm, I'm, proving this, absolutely. How yeah. can that be proven? Well, it's I surveys, don't know. surveys, polling. So. I, oh, right. I don't okay. think I dare Google that. You never know what might pop, <laughs> pop Do you think, do you, yeah, do, Suzanne, do you think it is best to date if you've got the same political opinions? Do you know what? I mean, I'm kind of far too old to be in the dating scene now, but um, I think it's really interesting. You look at, I assume, the way in which some of these dating apps work is they try and match you with people who are like you. Mm. I think that's wrong. I think part of the excitement about being with somebody new is getting a new perspective about learning, having new interests, about getting a different opinion. And, of course, there's that famous phrase, isn't there, opposites attract. Mm. I think if you just try and find somebody who's exactly like you, A, you're going to fail, and B, life's going to be a bit boring. Yeah, I would, oh, I, don't I, would. Know. I, I think, think expand your heart. Horizons. In common. I You've think... got a stuff in common, but also things where you differ. But I think, yeah, I think your political approach political, to things, I think political your values, values, isn't it? It's I your think values. There's a, there is a values thing, so I definitely don't agree about being that narrowly prescriptive, but there are certain really significant and important values that people have where I think actually you probably do need to be quite aligned. Yes, but that's not necessarily oh, political, is it's it? It's not necessarily political, and I don't agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, politics oh. is, is different, I think, from values. Yeah. Political ideology, um, I think a, a two, you can have two different political parties, but actually, when you look down into some of the issues, they've basically got the same values, they just argue about how they're going to get to that objective. Yeah. Oh, it's difficult. The opposite, opposites attract, as you say. But then you have, um, you know, Sir Philip Davis and Lady Esther McVeigh, as they now are. Um, and oh, obviously yes. they're very happily married. Like balls but on the, Yvette Cooper. On the same side, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Same side. Uh, let us know what you think. You would definitely have I an opinion Esther's, on this. Esther's punching there. She's punching. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Esther. Well, she's in a very, very She'll attractive right wing well. woman, isn't she? That's a good example. Yeah. Very attractive. Well, you know, yes, you see, exactly. Proven, there you go. Proven. proven. There you go, Suzanne. Munch and Esther. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, let us know. GBviews at gbnews.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. Can we have a look at Jason Donovan? <sighs> Is he dressed up as Dr Frankenfurter? I don't know what that means. Oh, he's... He's, he's in Rocky Horror. He's in Rocky Horror. I, oh, I, I do that before, can see the, he? I do. He has in London, but he's, he's now doing it somewhere else. I forget where now, but I do hope we can see oh, the picture. Because oh, we haven't got a picture. Amazing. Oh, we do. Here we go. Oh, Sorry. here we go. Great. Daryl's... Oh. Oh! Fantastic. Wonderful. It's Shirley Bassett. Jason Donovan? 
<laughs> that wasn't the picture I was looking at earlier. Oh. There was a very good picture of him in stockings and suspenders. Oh, oh well, maybe it's, and, it's pre -watershed. Uh, far more exciting. It's pre-watershed. Uh, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Great pair so, of legs. Anyway, on, though, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, oh, not really? bad. Oh, very much not so. bad. Um, but I just think it was such a contrast with you know Jason Donovan. We all remember him in Neighbours, don't yeah. we? Scott and Charlene, the perfect couple, totally faithful to each other despite temptations, clean cut as anything. And now here he is as Dr. Frankenfurter, letting it all hang out. Oh. Yeah, well, there you go. On that <laughs> note, we shall move on. Thanks. It's been good to see you both. Thank you. Thank Here's you. your weather. Thank you. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers. And in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north, most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland. Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett in Surrey. The anti-clockwise M25 is closed for accident investigation work. That's from junction 6 for Godston to 5 for the M26. Those queues are pretty solid back to the M23 at junction 7. Clockwise queues from just after junction 4 for Orpington as people slow down to have a look at what's going on. Anti-clockwise M25, we've got a lane blocked on the exit slip at junction 25 for Enfield. A van has broken down on that stretch. Hampshire, the southbound M27 one. We've got a lane blocked by an accident here as well. That's from the M27 Junction 3 for Southampton Docks to Junction 1 for Brownhill Way at Nursling. Uh, some quite heavy delays off the back of that all the way along that stretch. There's more in 30 minutes. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Morning to you. It's nine o'clock on Thursday, the 4th of April. Today, the Prime Minister threatens to sever ties with the European Court of Human Rights over his Rwanda plan. Yes, Rishi Sunak desperately wants to get people on flights to Rwanda. He's heavily hinting now that that means he will support withdrawing from the ECHR if that's what it takes. A Labour landslide. A new poll reveals Tories could suffer the worst election defeat on record, with Sir Keir Starmer's party predicted to win 400 seats. New guidelines reveal judges should consider more lenient sentences for criminals from disadvantaged backgrounds amid concerns it would create a divide with the middle classes. British farmers launch a campaign to demand universal basic income for agricultural workers in a bid to improve their financial security. Morning. Watch out for some heavy, possibly thundery downpours in the southeast first thing this morning. Otherwise, there'll be a few showers around and feeling pleasantly warm in any bright or sunny spells. I'll have the forecast later. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Uh, just to say, because I was being slightly cheeky about Esther McVeigh earlier on, uh, she has messaged <laughs> to say she's watching, so I'm in a whole heap of trouble. I bet you are. Didn't think about that one, did yeah, you? Morning, Esther. I did. He's teasing you, Esther. He loves I... you just as much as he loves Sir Philip. You know, I love Esther. Me, me um, Esther and Phil went out for breakfast one morning. Did you really? And it was, um, do you know, it was one of the best sort of hours I've had in ages, because we were just... It's like three northerners having a right good... Gossip. Did you have a good giggle? It was proper northern. It was just lovely. It was really fun. Oh, where'd you go? Sometimes just around the corner. Yeah. Why wasn't but, I invited? I don't know. You're from, Esther? You're, from Phil? Es you're from Essex. I can be an honorary northerner. No. Oh. No. Sometimes if you're a northerner, you know what it's like. You just need to get with a few of your own. Oh, okay. and, and let I know when I'm not wanted. Let the northern out. All right. There you go. Well, you go and have your northern brunch. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. I'll be though. here. It's really nice because sometimes when you're down this end of the country, you can't be uh, you can't be your true self. Um, I was just going to say very quickly on the um, offenders thing. Mm. And I've lost. If me you a can bit find of, it. Is I've it lost this one? Bit, no. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff yeah, in Rotherham. Uh, I went to prison in in the 1980s for 17 months of one mistake of misaccounting. Um, I've since been unable to get a job because all jobs want police checks and as soon as that shows, I'm not considered for even an interview. Mm. Can't do anything to do with children, even though the offence has nothing to do with children. Um, so to stop people re-offending, employers and the people who set the guidelines must look at the circumstances of the offence and give people a fair chance to get back into work. I think that's a really valid point. It is a really valid point, yeah. Actually. All about rehabilitation, isn't it, and re-entering society. And being yeah. a fully-fledged member of that society as well. Well, you want to contribute. You want people to contribute positively into society mm. once they come out of prison. Otherwise, what's the point? Anyway, uh, thanks for getting in touch, Jeff, about that one. Um, should we have a look at our main news today? Let's. The Prime Minister has suggested he will pull out of the European Court of Human Rights if it stands in the way of his Rwanda migration scheme. Yeah, the Prime Minister said controlling illegal immigration is more important to him than membership of the legal body and he wouldn't let, as he called it, a foreign court interfere in sovereign affairs. Well, let's get the thoughts of our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, who is live in Westminster for us. Good to see you, Catherine. And Rishi Sunak is clearly so determined to see these flights to Rwanda take off that he is threatening to sever ties to the ECHR. 
Yes, he is. Remember, it's one of his five pledges. They haven't been going terribly well, have they? And, you know, Labour are forecast currently to be on course for a landslide. So he is very, very keen, if not to stop the boats, as he promised, at least to get uh, a number of people on flights to Rwanda before the next election. Now, the safety of Rwanda bill is making its way through Parliament. They faced a big battle in the House of Lords. When it passes it's very possible indeed it will be challenged in the courts again um previous attempts to send people to Rwanda have been blocked by the european court also worth saying by british courts too so rishi sunak is now saying that he regards tackling illegal immigration as more important uh, than abiding by uh, the, the strictures of a European court, calling it a foreign court that will appeal to uh, a lot of voters uh, towards the right, potential Conservative voters who might be toying with voting for reform and also appeal to a number of MPs in his own party, people like Soella Braverman, the former Home Secretary, that's been calling for this for a long time. Worth saying, though, it will um, horrify quite a number of more centrist uh, Conservative MPs with the One Nation group. It may even lead to Cabinet resignations if it happens. And it might also um, alienate quite a number of Conservative voters down south who might then possibly go and vote for the Lib Dem. So nothing easy about this. I think he really, really does not want to go there. Um, but it is possible, depending on the, on the uh, local election results in May, depending on whether he gets people onto flights, that he may feel he's got no choice but to make this a manifesto pledge to pull out of the ECHR um, going into the next election. Uh, that election, of course, we don't know when it will be. It is possible it might be in the summer, more likely towards the end of the year. OK, Catherine Forster there for us in Westminster. Thank you very much indeed. Now, as we've been covering all morning, actually, it's got you going on the emails. Judges have been told to consider more lenient sentences for offenders from deprived backgrounds. Yes, the Sentencing Council has, for the first time, explained the mitigating factors that include poverty, low educational attainment, experience of discrimination and insecure housing. Well, earlier we spoke to former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blacksley. She's always have done and they always will do. They do not need it laying out from a body, the Sentencing Council, formed in 2010, which, with this ridiculous set of guidelines, has just shown how unfit for purpose it is. Judges take these factors into account. This is deeply insulting to anybody who was born into poverty, who was not particularly academic, who went on to make a decent living, uh, contributing to society, and quite frankly, it's just shown that this council that was established in 2010 is not fit for purpose and should be abolished forthwith. And, it, you know, Peter, depending on whatever background you're from, whether that's upper class, whether it's whether you're born into poverty, you should know the difference between right and wrong, surely? Absolutely, and we should all be judged as equals in the eyes of the law. But this just flies in the face of all that. And let's look at the broader picture here. In the UK, sadly, our streets are becoming increasingly lawless. We have an absolute epidemic of shoplifting and assaults on uh, retail staff. There's massive increase in violent crime. Car crime is, is dreadful. Burglary, none of these are being investigated. Nobody's being caught. So on those occasions when people are arrested, charged, put in front of a court and convicted, what, what are people going to do now? They're simply going to say, I came from a tough background, life was hard for me, so please give me a lesser sentence. There are no deterrents these days, which is why, sadly, crime does pay. You say this highlights the need to basically get rid of the sentencing council, but isn't it necessary, Peter, I mean, it's, it, 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 to provide those guidelines so that judges up and down the country are, are sentencing in a similar way? It's these guidelines that have led to so many sentences that have had the public and the media up in arms in recent years. This body was only formed 14 years ago. It's not like it's cemented into the very heart and soul 
of our judiciary. And having been in many, many courts and in front of many, many judges as a witness, I hasten to add, rather than a defendant, I've always uh, erred on the side of trusting the wisdom of judges to come to their decisions. It is judges who hear all the facts of a case and not the sentencing counsel. So I think this kind of prescriptive uh, instructions that are being handed down are damaging. They tie the hands of judges very often, and consequently, people do not receive the suitable punishments that they should. Mm. Do you fear that this will excuse criminality? Yes, and that's why it's so deeply insulting to people like me, who, who, who came from a, a, a rather impoverished background, please forgive me, um, who came from a rather impoverished background, didn't achieve particularly well at school, and then went on to live a law-abiding life. It's so, so insulting to people to just say, well, if, you're, if your start in life is difficult, then we'll understand if you go off and have a life of crime. Utterly insulting. Now, British farmers have launched a campaign to demand universal, universal basic income for agricultural workers in a bid to improve financial security within the sector. Well, before Brexit, farmers heavily relied on EU subsidies, but now the government are having to replace this with other schemes. Well, according to a report, the new systems won't actually plug the funding gap that's let, set to be left during this transition period. Well, GB News' Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beattie joins us now. Very good morning to you, Doogie. It is very difficult on farms right now, isn't it? It's extremely difficult. Input costs are up over 35% on farms. But that's as we've been reporting on GB News for the past couple of years. The price of fertiliser went up and especially those environmental issues that are there. And of course that farmers are receiving even less for their, their milk prices. But you know, we get milk prices and people say, oh, well, it's cheaper in Tesco's. Well, that's not including the price of cheese has gone up, the price of milk chocolate has gone up, the price of yogurts have gone up. These are all byproducts of dairy farms and of course this is hitting farmers when they're asked uh, to do things like ammonia nitrate uh, taxations on methane and of course uh, then we have the tree planting situation where good ground is going to be planted in the trees in order to uh, force these environmental issues and then on top of it food prices with the inflation have been getting forced down so why that 35 percent is on input costs is going up on the farm the farmer's income is coming down so it's not so much that we came out of out of europe it's the fact i mean i mean French farmers uh, are about 40% less than the average wage in France, so it shows you it's right across Europe. Leaving Europe wasn't the problem as such. It is with trade, but actually joining me now is uh, Edwin Poots, and he was the former uh, Agriculture Minister for Northern Ireland and was in those negotiations when we, we were trying to sort out what would happen with our single farm payment, etc. And Edwin, I mean, what sort of challenges were you coming against with civil servants? Well, a lot of civil servants don't understand agriculture, <clears throat> and that's a big problem, particularly in Britain. A lot of them are, are London-based, and they're, they're Westminster-centric. So they don't get it, um, what's going on in Cornwall or Durham or Northumbria or, or in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland isn't so bad. Our civil servants, a lot of them have had agricultural backgrounds, agricultural degrees, and uh, we are well placed. Uh, but in terms of farms, you know, we need more efficiency in our farms because you've just talked about the prices uh, being reduced. Milk has come down 40 percent, but Tesco's etc. haven't reduced the price of butter, cheese and, and all of those other products by anything like that. So the consumer is paying more while the farmer is getting less. And Britain needs to invest in its farmers. Uh, the equipment behind me is all British. The tractor is made in England, uh, the tanker is made in County Armagh, the piece of equipment in the back of it is made in County Down. And that piece of equipment reduces the amount of ammonia that goes into the atmosphere, it improves the amount of nutrients that goes into the soil. That's an investment which helps the farmer and helps the environment at the same time. And we need to have more of that sensible planting along waterways uh, and, and very steep areas and so forth, marginal areas, as opposed to planting out good land and trees. We can do so much more for the the environment, um, but also ensure that we can make our farms more efficient at the same time. 
Well, and of course, on the 30th of April, uh, the UK will be hit with the same sort of problems that we had and I've been reporting on it the last two years uh, with the protocol and with uh, charges going into food coming in to Great Britain in order to uh, look after those border posts. Uh, so that means that really you will be so much better off if you buy British food. Uh, it is the cheap imports that's coming in and arriving on our supermarket shelves that is really doing damage to farming throughout the UK. OK, Doogie, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> so, coming up at 9.30 is Britain's <laughs> newsroom with Andrew Pearce and Beb Turner. We're already having a giggle, aren't we? we so are. Good Always. luck. You're here till midday. Yeah. Uh, yes, we are. We've just been discussing, haven't we, this um, softer sentences for people from deprived backgrounds. Um, I have a little bit of sympathy for this. She's going soft. Well... Liberal. <laughs> What's becoming of it? <laughs> you know... Why should we make allowances for where they come from? Well, if they've had a particularly... Judges will take, judges well, take people's life chances into account. We do not need a prescriptive... No, uh, yes, but, the, but that's... The, but, that's but that doesn't make Bev liberal, does it? If she's just saying, well, that liberal. happens anyway. No, she's going liberal. <laughs> she's got sympathy with this. It's outrageous. It's patronising, <laughs> insulting to people I from think it's... a, a working-class background. I think it's just a sort of bit of sympathy that some people are just born into really difficult families which are riven with crime and therefore there is inevitability that they will take over um, that mantle of going into crime as well. I guess what's more important is what do you do with these people when they are in prison? Mm. Give them a soft sentence by all means, but also give them purpose, give them sport, give do them they education. Them? No. Give them confidence. Well, some do. They some do. Of them come out and reoffend. Yeah, but yeah, but that's because they're not properly rehabilitated. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm also rather fascinated by this front page of the Mail story that there are going to be MPs who've been caught in a honey trap uh, sex sting. It's the kind of thing that actually tabloid journalists used to do. Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. Now the speculation is that it might be a, a rogue Russia. political state. Well, has anyone actually been caught it or they've just been targeted? I well, can't who look knows? Well, that more will come out on this one, I think. Mm. And will the names come out? Because there's quite a lot of... Interestingly, it was not just MPs. People who work for MPs have been targeted too, and I notice a lot of them are Labour staffers. But this is a sign. Whoever's behind mm. this can see where the pendulum of power is swinging. Oh. Labour. And also the worst rivers in the UK. We're going to be sending one of our reporters to get some water out of oh. one of the worst rivers. But we're not in going the to make UK. her drink it because we'd like to see her again. Yeah. Yeah, it's grim. I mean, this. I don't know what to make of, of the state of our water at the moment. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's the so water depressing. companies. It's cheaper for them to bung the stuff in the river and, and pay a fine rather than deal with it properly. Mm. It's a shocker. Yeah, but um, how do you stop that? I, um, I honestly think, I, and I'm not normally well, a fan need, of this, we, but I well, think we need I would, some reservoirs. We need, some we need a lot of reservoirs, and I would probably take water back into public ownership. Oh. Which, you the, are, which, again. which the Labour Party had as their policy, and they've now abandoned it. And we're going live to Tenerife to find out why yes. Brits abroad are such a problem. Ooh. Oh, if you got, if we haven't sent someone to Tenerife. We've got, we're talking, we're no. talking to a bar owner who's oh. very unhappy that the locals want British tourists out. Well, that would be the end of their economy. Well, they need well, us, they don't they? They, they need do. us Brits. They do, they but do. we need to behave while we're out there. Well, yeah, but be careful what you wish do. for. I always, I always do. I don't even drink, Andrew. I'm... It doesn't stop you misbehaving. No. You're, you're teetotal. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. So not true. I just <laughs> chew on an olive and have a glass of water. <laughs> well, I do. Very thank, good. Thank right, you two. You are fast. Now, it's our biggest giveaway of the year so far. This is a cracker. Your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise for two. But that's not all, is it, Miss Costello? It's not, Mr Dixon. £10,000 of cash and a whole host of luxury travel gifts too. So your 2025 holiday could be on us. Here's all the details that you need to enter. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel 
gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7pm. Scotland's new hate crime law, which comes into effect on April Fool's Day, criminalises threatening or abusive or insulting behaviour, which is intended to stir up hatred against people based on age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. The act has proved controversial. The head of uh, complaints at the police watchdog says it could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. But the bill's defenders say it is nowhere near as draconian as is being suggested and uh, protecting people from hate is long overdue. So joining me to discuss this, the Alba MP for Kakaldi, uh, Neil Hanvey. Welcome to the show, Neil. Uh, now, Hamza Youssef has come out and said there's been a lot of disinformation about this. People are overreacting. Uh, this bill is absolutely fine. Uh, is he right? Uh, no, well, I, I made a, a bit of a light-hearted comment on his claim that there's disinformation being spread about uh, this legislation uh, by saying he'd misspelled information. Uh, because what's really happening is that people are spreading the truth uh, about this legislation. And it's, you know, nobody is saying that um, hate crime should be uh, given a green light. Uh, but the, the the way that this bill has been, or this act, has been constructed uh, is deliberately intended to prevent um, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of belief. There are certain uh, elements that are excluded from the bill, particularly around gender cri critical beliefs, and most importantly, um, sex as a, a as a class. So, women's sex based rights are not covered by this bill. Uh, sex. The, the bill is silent on the definition of sex, and therefore, same sex attraction is effectively meaningless, uh, and it really has a chilling effect on political discourse. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, Yorkshire has four of the top ten worst rivers in the country for sewage dumping, apparently, with tens of thousands of spillages taking place right across the county. But some water firms are taking action, with Yorkshire Water re recently completing a new 835-metre sewer designed to prevent storm overflows. Well, let's talk to our Yorkshire and Humber reporter, Anna Riley. Morning, Anna. Good morning to you both. Well, I'm here at the River Wharf in Weatherby, a very picturesque spot, as you can see. It's a place where people come to paddle, they come for picnics, and people even swim here in this river. But it's on the list that the Liberal Democrats have released as to one of the most uh, polluted 
in England, uh, they've put a list of 20 together and four, as you mentioned, out of the top 10 list of most polluted rivers are found here in Yorkshire. Now, Sir Davy will be calling for a blue flag status. The leader of the Lib Dems calling for a blue flag status for um, rivers to reduce the amount of sewage that water companies can pump into them. As part of this blue flag status, that would give reassurance to swimmers and people going into the river um, that they won't get ill from contamination. And it also um, be fining companies as well, water companies that are releasing uh, spills into the river. I'm just leaning forward because I've actually took a scoop of water uh, from the river here behind me. I don't know if you can see against this white background that I've got. It is discoloured. Some river water is naturally uh, a brown. I can't see anything floating in here. Don't worry, I'm not going to drink it. Um, but it just shows that you don't know exactly what is in the water, as you can see here. Um, and if you are a swimmer and you do take in contaminated water, it can cause a lot of problems. It can lead to uh, gastrointestinal problems, stomach bugs that can become serious, diarrhea, vomiting, also respiratory infections, ear infections, eye infections, lots of nasty stuff um, that you don't necessarily want. So that's why this blue flag status has been put in place. The government currently are putting in plans to upgrade water systems. The, bo the, the Body Water UK also is. And as you mentioned earlier, Yorkshire Water are doing a lot to improve systems, including a £180 million scheme uh, by April 2025 to improve uh, the, the, the drainage system so we're not getting as much sewer uh, water into rivers. OK, okay. Anna, thank you. Don't be drinking that water. Oh, no. Thank you very much. Grim, isn't it? Britain's newsroom is up next, but first, here's your weather with Alex. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There is some heavy rain in the south at first this morning, but that's clearing away to leave quite a few showers for many of us. But do take care in the southeast. Could be some thundery downpours for a time before that clears away. And then, yes, a scattering of showers across many places, these most frequent across England and Wales. But there should be some decent bright sunny spells in between the showers. And in these sunny breaks, feeling pleasantly warm with temperatures reaching highs of around 15 or 16 Celsius. Quite a bit colder than this further north, most places staying in single digits, perhaps just about getting into double figures across western parts of Scotland. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day and overnight. Swathes of rain pushing up from the southwest. This could be pretty heavy and a bit persistent at times, so a pretty wet night for most of us. And some hill snow perhaps dropping to slightly lower levels for a time as across parts of Scotland. Across the far north of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost here, otherwise staying pretty mild because of the cloudy, wet and blustery weather. We do have some further blustery weather to come as we go through Friday. It is going to be a wet story across much of Scotland, but the rain gradually edging its way northwards as we go through the day, taking the hill snow with it. Otherwise, outbreaks of showery rain, which are likely to be heaviest and most frequent across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, towards much of England and Wales, actually largely dry, and we are going to see our temperatures rising to 17 or 18. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Julian Brett. The anti-clockwise M25 in Surrey is closed, I'm afraid, for accident investigation work. That's between junction 6 for Godston to 5 for the M26. Queues back to the M23 at junction 7. We've got queues from the split just before junction 5 as people slow down to have a look at what's going on there as well. Hampshire, the M271, the southbound stretch has a lane blocked by an accident. That's from the M27 at junction 3 for Southampton Docks to junction 1 for nursling. Into Cambridgeshire, the A428 westbound is closed. There's been an accident between St Neots Road at Maddingley and the Camborne Junction. The eastbound stretch, however, is fully back open now. Very, very slow in the area. There's more in 30 minutes. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com.
Farage. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. The real danger to our democracy, of course, always was China. And we learn overnight, we'd heard in August last year that the Electoral Commission's website had been compromised, their database had been compromised. And we learn overnight that, yes, actually, the Chinese Communist Party now have access to 40 million voters in this country and their data. Well, to respond to this in the House of Commons earlier, we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities, 